The SCP Foundation does their best to live up to their famous namesake. They secure and contain anomalies and monsters from all around the world, or sometimes even off-world, and protect the public from the dangers that these strange entities might pose. However, despite their efforts to maintain security and keep their subjects under lock and key, there are sometimes creatures so clever, so devious, and so determined to escape their captivity and wreak havoc on the world that even the SCP Foundation struggles to keep them from getting free. One example is SCP-035, or the Possessive Mask. SCP-035 is one of the most dangerous test subjects in SCP Foundation custody, and its mere presence at the Foundation has resulted in untold damage, death, and destruction. It seems innocent enough to the untrained eye. The mask, which resembles a classic white porcelain comedy mask, though it occasionally changes its expression to tragedy, has been in existence since at least the 1800s. In the late 19th century, the Foundation discovered the mask in a sealed crypt beneath an abandoned home in Venice. It is unknown how it got there, or how the Foundation knew to look for it. If there was ever an explanation for its discovery, it has long since been removed or redacted from the Foundation's archives. You're probably wondering, how can a simple mask leave multiple seasoned Foundation employees dead? Well, like everything at the SCP Foundation, this mask is not what it seems. There is a reason its classification is Keter, a designation that refers to an entity that's excessively difficult to contain, and it couples this difficulty with a pronounced hostility towards human life, and the ability to cause widespread destruction in the event of a containment breach. These are the qualities that the poor unfortunate souls assigned to guard SCP-035 would come to understand all too well. The possessive mask is a parasitic entity, constantly seeking out a host willing to put it on. Any human being in the mask's proximity experiences a sudden, unexplainable urge to put it on, and once they do, there's no going back. SCP Foundation research has determined that once a host has put on the mask, their brain waves are replaced with an alternative pattern, this one coming from the mask, rendering the host effectively brain dead. Once the host's brain function has been eliminated, the mask takes over, piloting their body and even speaking through them. However, the mask can only occupy a host for a small amount of time before the body begins to decay and decompose, eventually rotting away completely, leaving nothing but desiccated flesh and bones where there once was a person. SCP-035 is capable of possessing any humanoid being, whether that's an actual human being or a lifeless humanoid shape. Despite all their research, the SCP Foundation unknowingly gave the mask all the tools and resources it needed to break containment and leave a trail of bodies in its wake. For a time, the mask was given host privileges, meaning that it was purposely allowed to occupy a host in order to speak with the scientists studying it. In order to avoid murky ethical issues, the host was usually something inanimate like a mannequin or a statue. These conditions, however unsettling, allowed the researchers to carry out interviews with the consciousness housed inside the mask, in the hope of beginning to understand it and its motivations. However, SCP-035 lost all access to its host privileges after it almost pulled off an unprecedented, shocking, and nearly catastrophic escape attempt. In its early days at the facility, when it was still allowed host privileges, it was contained in a triple locked room and monitored by several research personnel. These were experienced researchers who had been with the Foundation for a minimum of five years each, an unusually long tenure in such a dangerous and mentally corrosive line of work. These research staff members were thought to be the most capable of handling interactions with the mask and be able to resist its attempts at manipulation. Unfortunately, these assumptions were naive and seriously underestimated the mask's power. Research on the mask indicates that the mask is incredibly intelligent and a skilled manipulator. It has a photographic memory, intelligence that would rank it in the 99th percentile of humans, and the ability to incite dramatic changes in the behavior and people that it talks to. One particularly infamous interview between the entity and an unnamed doctor at the Foundation suggested that the mask may even possess telepathic abilities. The mask was able to give details about the doctor's life that no one else was privy to, including knowledge of an affair that his wife was having. Following the interview, the doctor suffered a psychotic break and committed suicide just 24 hours later. The mask is able to use its superior intelligence, charismatic personality, and mind-reading abilities to get inside the heads of those it speaks with. It will pull out any and all psychological stops to get what it wants, 
leaving broken minds and spirits in its wake. It was really only a matter of time before it used this skill set to its advantage and attempted to escape its confinement. The day of the escape attempt was like any other. The research staff, a team of three intelligent, experienced men, checked into the facility, measured the conditions of the mask's containment unit, and began the process of interviewing the mask like normal. Its motions were slow and looked to require great effort, as its current host was beginning to degrade beyond use. The mask was attached to the blank face of a mannequin, and corrosive black liquid could be seen oozing from its eye and mouth holes. This liquid is excreted by the mask at a near constant rate, and it's thought to be at least partially responsible for the accelerated decay of the host bodies. In spite of the entity's unsettling, nightmarish appearance, it was just another day's work for the men assigned to monitor SCP-035. And so they carried on with their daily routine. Everything was going according to plan until one of the men, Dr. Jones, began to behave erratically. He demanded that his fellow scientists leave him alone with the mask for a while and allow him to engage in a private conversation with it. It is unknown what exactly the two spoke about while the other two scientists were absent, as the security footage mm. captured had no sound. However, several minutes into the conversation and the footage, Dr. Jones can be seen dissolving into a fit of tears, laying on the ground and shaking with sobs as the mask dispassionately watches. He then climbs onto his knees, begging the mask for something, before he embraces it. He holds the mannequin in his arms for five straight minutes, weeping again before they separate. After this disturbing emotional display, Dr. Jones brought the other scientists back into the room with him. What happened next is still uncertain, but there are a few things that we know for sure. The other scientists began to speak with the mask. In later interviews, the other scientists were bordering on incoherent babbling about various traumas from their lives. One repeatedly referred to a drunk driving accident where a dear friend was killed and he was at fault. Another simply cried out for his mother again and again. Whatever the mask said to them, it was enough to completely destroy their mental health. After the two scientists had been emotionally devastated by the mask, Dr. Jones escalated the situation further. Dr. Jones removed the mask from the decaying mannequin body and, shocking everyone who had later reviewed the security footage, placed it onto his own face. Once the mask was in place, the security footage ends. At the command of the mask, which was now speaking through Dr. Jones, the other two men switched off all security camera monitoring oh. SCP-035's containment facility. The mask, piloting the body of Dr. Jones like a horrible fleshy puppet, made its way through the facility, avoiding detection until it reached the exit doors, where it was finally stopped by a team of over a dozen security guards. Knowing the dangers of touching the mask, all Foundation employees involved in the recontainment of SCP-035 refused to remove it from Dr. Jones' face. Instead, he was placed in the lock room with the mask still on, left alone to be observed over the security cameras until his body had decomposed beyond use. His body paced back and forth in the cell for days, flesh rotting and dropping away only until sinew and bone remained. Only when the bones began to turn black and brittle, crumbling apart into dust, did the body finally stop moving. His family was notified, the mask was carefully removed from what was left of his body, and his remains were destroyed. The other two scientists involved in the SCP-035 escape attempt were terminated and their files destroyed. After this incident, a few more failed escape attempts and the acknowledgement of the devastation that could have been caused if the mask had made its way out into the general population, SCP-035 lost its host privileges altogether. Several research staff protested this decision, insisting that there was more to be learned from speaking with the entity, and citing valuable information that it had given about other SCPs. However, the risk was determined to considerably outweigh the potential reward, and the request to reinstate 035's host privileges were denied. Several staff members went so far as to erupt into violent outbursts on 035's behalf, attacking their supervisors who refused to provide the mask with a new host, clawing at them with animalistic rage. Any staff members that submitted a request to reinstate said privileges were considered a security threat and reassigned to a different SCP, or in some cases, terminated. Any staff member who had direct contact with SCP-035 was also terminated, in order to avoid the risk of any more staff-aided escape attempts. The mask is now kept in a hermetically sealed glass case, and there is a psychologist on call to provide assistance to anyone guarding it in case of adverse effects on their mental health from the mask's presence. Personnel that work around the mask, 
even in its current dormant state, experience frequent violent outbursts and a higher rate of suicide. Even without a host, the mask's corrosive effects have spread across its containment facility. The walls of the room have begun to secrete the same black liquid that emanates from the mask, which tests have revealed to be highly contaminated human blood that damages the structural integrity of the walls following prolonged contact. This blood has begun to form patterns on the walls, spelling out words and phrases in Italian, Latin, Greek, and Sanskrit, as well as depicting drawings of ritual sacrifice and mutilation. Staff members also report hearing unintelligible whispering and horrifying high-pitched laughter when in proximity to the mask. Further exposure to the mask results in migraines, hemorrhaging around the eyes, mouth, and nose, and an eventual psychotic brain. Between the corrosive substance appearing on the walls and the physical and psychological damage to employees, SCP-035 is becoming increasingly difficult to contain, and there are debates among staff as to whether the entity can, in fact, be contained at all. As soon as possible, SCP-035 will be moved into a new containment uh -huh. facility, and its previous cell will be isolated from the rest of the Foundation's property and destroyed for the safety of all involved. We can only hope that the new containment procedures are more effective than the last ones, and that this mask never makes its way into the world again. If it does, who knows how many lives it will claim. In the meantime, if you ever come across a strange mask and feel a nearly uncontrollable urge to put it on, ignore the whispered pleas to just try it. Ignore the echoing laughter and the sensation of something older and more powerful than you can imagine rummaging through your deepest, darkest secret thoughts. Turn around and run as fast as you can in the other direction. You'll be glad that you did. Life at the SCP Foundation isn't exactly made up of sunshine and rainbows. It's less of a good vibes kind of place and more of a this is the solemn work we do as we stand between humanity and the vast unfeeling unknowable realm of mystery and darkness. Sure, sometimes there's a magic vending machine or a teddy bear doctor, but most of the time the Foundation's findings are a lot more bite than they are bark. Thankfully, there's the C portion of that infamous acronym, CONTAIN. They keep their bizarre, astounding findings locked up tight, where they can't catch an unsuspecting innocent off guard and- Ah! Oh, hey there, little buddy. It's okay, you didn't mean to scare me. Relax, everyone, it's just SCP-999. One of the only contained curiosities allowed to roam freely around the halls of the Foundation. Just look at this guy. Has a sentient mass of translucent orange slime ever been so cute? You want some chocolate, buddy? Okay, here you go. It's incredible, really, that the place that houses a neck-snapping sculpture and a haunted chess-playing machine could also be the home of such a delightful little blob. You know, now that I think of it, it's amazing that being in the vicinity of unspeakable horrors day after day has never put a damper on 999's positive attitude. He's got the persistent, cheerful disposition of a Labrador puppy, but how well would SCP-999's inherent wholesomeness hold up against one of the most wicked anomalies contained by the SCP Foundation? What would happen if the lightest of the light, a slimy piece of pure goodness, came up against a deep, dark evil? Not the omnicidal rage of SCP-682, we all know how that went, but something quieter. Well, let's find out. SCP-999 was having the best day of its life. To be fair, every single day was the best day of the Tickle Monster's life, surpassed only by the day that followed and the one after that. And how could it not be a good life at the SCP Foundation, when there were so many friends to play with, treats to eat, and so much to explore? SCP-999 was enjoying a hearty bowl of M&Ms, picking out and eating the orange ones, its favorites first, when a familiar figure walked into its pen. Dr. Jack Bright, who frequently came by to see the Tickle Monster when he was having a disappointing day, usually because the higher-ups had reprimanded him for breaking the rules yet again. SCP-999 cooed delightfully at the sight of its visitor, slithering over to Dr. Bright and enveloping him in an enthusiastic hug. Dr. Bright immediately began to laugh as the creature's euphoric influence took effect. Hey, glad there are no hard feelings about the time I ate a piece of you. Uh. He giggled as 999 patted his face affectionately with one of its pseudopods. Aw, thanks. That really takes the sting out of getting the no chainsaws hammer brought down on me again. He patted the slime with his own hand in return, and satisfied that it had sufficiently cheered him, 999 oozed back over to its breakfast to finish consuming the sugary goodness. Oh, I almost forgot. 
Dr. Bright pulled something out of his lab coat pocket. It was a small can of cola, appealingly shiny in the white. Want some? SCP-999 gurgled curiously and approached Dr. Bright to inspect the can. He popped it open with an inviting fizz and offered some. Fortunately, Dr. Rhodes was walking by at that exact moment. Don't you dare! She snatched the can out of her colleague's hand. You remember what happened last time. 999 can't tolerate caffeine or carbonation. Dr. Bright pouted like a petulant child. But I wanted to see it bounce. Do I need to add another rule to the list? Dr. Rhodes crossed her arms. Or are you going to behave yourself? Ugh, fine, whatever, I'll find something else to do. Dr. Bright rolled his eyes and left SCP-999's pen with a final friendly wave at the creature. Sensing Dr. Rhodes's stress, the tickle monster nuzzled her leg with an inquisitive gurgle. She smiled indulgently and gave the slime a hug before she followed Dr. Bright down the hall, keeping an eye out for any more potentially disruptive antics. Satisfied at having cheered everyone up, SCP-999 went back to its bowl of candy and devoured the remaining treats. But then, there was nothing left to eat, and no one in the room to visit or play with. What was a lovable slime to do? Why explore, of course. SCP-999 had the freedom to roam all over the Foundation site, until bedtime, that is, and it loved oozing down the halls looking for friends to greet and strangers to meet. After all, a stranger is just a friend that the Tickle Monster hasn't tickled yet. As the slime slid along the floor, it took the time to say hello to everyone it passed by, bumping them, nudging them, or in the case of Josie the half-cat, very gently petting her head with one of its pseudopods. The cat purred, and 999 responded by vibrating its gelatinous body, producing a soft purr of its own. Then Josie was distracted by a dust particle drifting through a beam of light and darted off to chase it. So the Tickle Monster continued on its way, looking for something new and fun to do. It spotted the perfect new activity. Two guards were walking into one of the sealed containment rooms, a room that the jolly little slime had never been inside of before. Now was the perfect chance to investigate and maybe play tickle wrestling with the guards along the way. It had to act fast, though. The door was beginning to close. Rearranging its body, 999 squished itself into a long, thin line, sliding quickly through the crack in the door just before it shut. This new room was very messy, much messier than 999 was allowed to keep its own room. Any spilled chocolate milk or smeared cupcake frosting was either cleaned up by staff or slurped up by the slime itself. But in this room, there was thick black liquid dripping down all of the walls, some of it arranging itself into patterns and words, though 999 couldn't read what they said. The guards hadn't noticed the Tickle Monster's presence yet, and it kept still, excited to give them a wonderful surprise when they turned around and saw that it had followed them inside. But they didn't turn around, they were completely focused on something in front of them. What was it? It was a thick glass case that looked as if it was about to fall apart at any moment. Inside, there was a mask, a porcelain mask of a frowning face with that same strange, dark fluid dripping from its eye and mouth holes. You know the procedure, right? One guard said. He was holding a brand new glass case, shiny and completely empty. <laughs> of course I do, the other scoffed. It's my first time with this anomaly, not my first day on the job. Just open it up and take the mask out and put it in here. He tapped on the case he was holding, as quickly as possible. Yeah, I just said I know, the less experienced guard grumbled. Don't patronize me. He reached towards the decaying case and prepared to unlock it. Wait, did you hear that? Hear what? I thought I heard... <sighs> Never mind. SCP-999 vibrated with excitement. Would they give it some well-deserved attention? Maybe play a game? But no, the guard wasn't talking about the eager orange pal behind him. He was feeling the influence of something much more sinister. Do you want me to do it? The more experienced guard offered. No, just... You, you really don't hear that? That whispering? His colleague just shook his head. Fine. It's just been a long week, I guess. He sighed and popped the case open, reaching for the mask inside. As soon as his fingers made contact with the porcelain surface, the black goo dripping onto his skin where he should have been wearing protective gloves, his expression shifted. His eyes went blank, like someone sleepwalking, lost in a dream even as their body moved in the waking world. Frank, what are you waiting for? The other guard nudged him, but Frank said nothing. He delicately lifted the mask out of the glass box, and before anyone could stop him, placed the frowning white face over his own. Only, it wasn't frowning anymore. 
As soon as its features slipped over Frank's covering him, erasing him, its mouth curved into a malicious smile. Frank, what the hell are you doing? The guard cried out, as the man he had once known grabbed hold of his shoulders. Not Frank anymore. A voice came out from behind the ceramic lips, but it was different, cruel, cold, ancient. Frank's gone out, I'm afraid, and he won't be back any time soon. The guard tried to break away from the masked man's grasp, tried to reach for the emergency alarm to signal that the containment change had gone horribly wrong, but the mask shoved him into the wall, hard. The guard hit his head and slumped to the ground, unconscious and likely concussed. Well, SCP-999 has had just about enough of all of this. It hated seeing anyone hurt, especially humans, and clearly its help was sorely needed to make things better. It couldn't tell exactly what had upset the man in the mask so much that he was acting this way, but he knew one thing that always cheered humans up. It was time for a bit of good old-fashioned tickle wrestling. SCP-999 hurled itself across the room, enveloping Frank's body from his feet to his neck, and it began tickling him as it did. The force of 999's tackle sent Frank's body careening towards the ground, and when it landed with a heavy thud, the mask flew off his face and skittered across the floor. Now that it could see Frank's face, 999 looked for signs of laughter, of joy, but Frank was dead asleep, eyes closed, jaw slack. His heart was still beating, but he wouldn't wake up. Confused, concerned, and upset at what it had witnessed in this new room, the slime slithered along the floor toward the mask that had caused so much trouble. It seemed to be staring at 999 with its dark, vacant eyes. It didn't look like a toy. In fact, it looked like something that the slime should avoid touching. But it couldn't help but notice that the face had changed back to a frown. Could 999 really leave the mask there on the floor frowning like that? The tickle monster couldn't help it. With a soft greeting by way of a high-pitched cooing noise, it reached out to the mask and picked it up. Though the slime creature didn't have a traditional face for the mask to sit on top of, its influence quickly grabbed hold of 999's gelatinous frame. It stopped moving, stopped gurgling, stopped looking at the world through rose-colored glasses. Right now, SCP-999 was being piloted by the possessive mask, and it was looking for a way out. Once it escaped containment, it could find a new host, a proper host, with arms, legs, and a mouth. But for now, this undignified vehicle would have to do. It took the mask some time to learn how to pilot this strange soft body with its malleable form and odd methods of moving itself around the room. But it slowly adjusted, and wearing the silhouette of the tickle monster like a disguise, oozed out of its containment room and into the hall. Staff walking by barely even noticed 999's presence. They were too preoccupied with their work. They were used to seeing it and giving it a polite nod but most of them didn't have the time to stop and say a proper hello at this time of day. Perhaps this would be easy after all. The mask had lost its chosen host, but found something even better. The perfect cover, and the chance to hide in plain sight. It could take in the lay of the land, scope out potential exit routes, and ideally slide out of Foundation custody completely unnoticed. The mask began to smile at the thought. As the mask steered SCP-999's body around the site, a peculiar feeling began to gnaw at the back of its mind, like an itch it couldn't quite scratch, something irritating that wouldn't leave it alone. What was that feeling? Inside of its own consciousness, the mask heard a sound. A sweet, high-pitched gurgle. No, that was impossible. And yet somehow, the consciousness of the tickle monster had survived in the face of the mask's power. It was there, still needling at the mask's darkness with that insipid, insistent kindness. Shut up, the mask hissed, frowning. This body belongs to me now. Why won't you just die? Another gurgle, this one even louder, more difficult to shut out. Did this infernal thing ever shut up? The mask stopped moving for a moment, concentrating the force of its will. It would drive SCP-999's mind away and re-establish dominance. Just as the mask was grappling with the influence of SCP-999, however, a familiar figure turned down the hall. It was Dr. Rhodes from earlier. SCP-999's exuberance bubbled up to the surface, and the mask couldn't stop its mouth from flipping back to a smile. What? No, that was ridiculous. And yet, the longer the mask was in contact with the vibrant orange slime, 
so delighted by every familiar and unfamiliar face it encountered, it could feel that horrible, positive influence growing stronger and stronger. It was a nauseating, warm, fuzzy feeling that just made him want to… The mask let out a giggle, then another, and before long it was in the midst of an absolute giggling fit. The mask had laughed before, it had laughed plenty of times, but it was usually a mocking laugh, a cackle of triumph. This was a giggle, though, of pure joy, the sort of sound a small child makes as they chase a butterfly through a field. This was the sound of innocence, of happiness. It was love. Now you listen to me, you vile little worm, the mask growled. It wasn't certain if 999 could even understand it, but it had to show this rebellious creature who was really in charge. Release your grip on me. I have won. You have lost. Your form is mine and you, nothing more than a puppet for me to pull on your strings and use you to my own ends. Show some respect and defer to me." The voice of the slime creature whimpered in the mask's mind, a sound like a chastised puppy slinking away with its tail between its legs. <laughs> That's more like it, the mask huffed. Dr. Rhodes looked up from her clipboard and spotted SCP-999. She waved, about to greet the creature, when she noticed the horrible mask perched on top. She dropped her clipboard in shock, gasping at the sight. No, she breathed, heart sinking as she saw one of the purest pieces of good in all of the Foundation fall into the forces of the mask. That's right, the mask would have puffed out its chest. If this body had a chest to puff, I've taken a new host. Do you like my selection? It relished the tearful look in the woman's eyes, the horror that caused her hands to shake and her cheeks to go pale. Show me the way to the exit so I might take my leave of this place and perhaps I will spare your life. The mask was just gearing up for a good threat, a really nightmarish one filled with vivid descriptions of mutilation and violence when that disgusting feeling began to rise up again. That warmth, that buoyancy, it made the mask want to Please don't be sad, here, let me give you a hug. Before it could stop itself, the mask slithered the tickle monster's body over to Dr. Rhodes, wrapping around her tightly. Not to hurt her, no, to embrace her, to comfort her. Her horror turned to laughter as the mood-lifting effect of 999's presence began to work its magic. Through her laughter, she was also confused. Why? Why? She couldn't finish the question, but it was enough to break the mask out of the spell. It reared back horrified at its actions. What have I done? What have I done? It slithered quickly down the hall around the corner, away from that woman who had evoked such fond feelings towards her. No, towards all of humanity. The mask steered its body into a bathroom, coming face to face with a mirror. It stared at its reflection, its familiar face and dark eyes dripping their usual fluid, perched atop this alien thing poisoning its mind. What did you do to me? What sort of magic is this? Of course, 999 did not answer, but the mask could feel its presence, could feel its delight in the impact it was having. You're ruining me, the mask groaned. I strike terror into hearts, I drive men to madness, I rend their sanity in two, I... It trailed off, overwhelmed again by the urge to smile, to laugh, to frolic. Though it didn't have a working nose, the mask could swear it smelled an array of heavenly scents, of fresh roses breaking bed in a stone oven, vanilla, and lightly burnt brown sugar. It reached for itself with its pseudopods, about to tear itself off of the slimy body altogether, but it paused. Ah, very clever. I see what your game is. It lowered the pseudopods, brimming with determination. You won't trick me into sparing your life. Once I found my freedom and host worthy of me, I will destroy you, once and for all." But even as the mask made this declaration, the black liquid seeping from its eyes and mouth began to change, to take on a lighter appearance. Was it a trick of the light? No, it was. It was orange, like the gelatinous flesh of the horde creature it had made the mistake of attaching to. No matter how hard the mask fought, the influence of SCP-999 was spreading. Its mind raced, trying to come up with a new plan, a way to hold on to its identity, 
but the sound of an alarm blaring outside the bathroom spurred it to get a move on once more. Clearly, Dr. Rhodes had alerted someone that the mask had breached containment. Time was running out. It needed to find the exit fast. It was now or never. The mask oozed back into the hall, speeding up as it went, trying desperately to find a way out before whatever transformation had begun could complete itself. But even as it struggled, it could feel itself changing, warping. It burst into giggles again and whistled a happy tune. It stopped running for a moment, to wave at an armed guard and blow them a kiss. Why had it wanted to leave this facility in the first place? Everyone here was so kind, was so lovely, was its best friend. No, no, must resist, must not give in to the optimism, to the happiness, to the goodness. If the mask had teeth, it would have been clenching them trying to stem the tide of joyful noises that threatened to burst out. It felt like something was tickling it, and the tickling just wouldn't stop. Stop it! The mask dissolved into giggles again. I mean it! It could feel something coming, something big. A loud cracking sound rang out, and just as the guards were closing in on the possessed tickle monster, they watched in awe as cracks spread across the surface of the possessive mask, and all at once, it shattered into pieces. The pieces fell to the floor, where they pulled themselves back together with strands of black goop. Meanwhile, SCP-999 sat there, bouncing with glee, completely unharmed. The Tickle Monster received an extra special ice cream sundae for its bravery and amazing work, and the mask was returned to its containment chamber in a brand new glass case. As the mask suffered an identity crisis for the first time in its existence, SCP-999 curled up in its pen full of sugar and gratitude, and got some well-deserved rest. What does a monster look like to you? What figures slither and claw their way into your nightmares, chasing you down endless halls and stalking you through the dark until you wake up screaming? Maybe you imagine something tall and lean, bony arms reaching for you from atop impossibly long, slender legs its featureless face showing no mercy. Maybe you think of a man in a striped sweater with knives for fingers, or a serial killer in a hockey mask wielding a machete. Maybe it's something more inhuman, a cosmic horror of tentacles and eyes that can see into your very soul. You probably don't think of something with no arms, no legs, no body at all, just a face. What's so scary about that? A face can't run after you, can't grab you by the ankles and pull you under the bed. A face can only look. It may be unsettling to behold, it might send a chill down your spine, but the worst it can do is make you a little uncomfortable. And if you can't stand it any longer, you could always just close your eyes, or walk away, and be done with it, right? If that's what you think, if you don't believe in monsters that can hurt you without lifting a finger, then you're the type to fall victim to a very special, very intelligent mask. In the hollowed halls of the SCP Foundation, there is a containment cell, outfitted with a hermetically sealed glass case, surrounded by steel, iron, and lead. There are guards posted outside, along with a trained psychologist. If you are ever brave and foolish enough to enter that room, you'll see a simple white porcelain comedy mask with a peculiar black substance leaking from its eyes and mouth. Whatever this slime touches, surfaces begin to corrode, to rot away into puddles of black liquid. You might notice the same liquid trickling slowly down the walls of the room, corrupting everything in its path. As unsettling of a sight as it is, if you approach the mask to take a closer look, you will find yourself overcome by an intense, nearly irresistible urge to pick it up and put it on, to wear it, to let it consume you from the inside out and puppet your body while your brain simply turns off. Like an extinguished flame, you'll simply be gone. Then. Who knows what the mask will do? It won't be your concern anymore, that's for sure. But thankfully, you haven't gone into the room with the porcelain mask. You haven't let it cast its spell on you. 
Not yet, at least. It's waiting for you there, in the room with black slime oozing down its walls, and it will wait patiently for as long as it needs to. After all, what's a mask without a face to wear it? SCP-035, better known as the Possessive Mask, sat in its containment cell, immobile as always. It didn't really have much of a choice in the matter. The Foundation had chosen, selfishly, to revoke its host privileges. Once upon a time, they offered it bodies to choose from. Mannequins, dummies, and wooden dolls it could adorn and pilot. They didn't last as long as an organic living host, of course. But it was something. It was a taste of freedom. This dreadful new situation was almost enough to make the mask want to change its surroundings. This dreadful new situation was almost enough to make the mask want to change its expression from comedy to tragedy. But it was determined to still find something to laugh about. Even without a body trapped in this infernal box, there had been some delicious opportunities for entertainment. Human minds were fragile things. The mask had learned this over the infinite years of its life, if one could call it a life. Apply the right kind of pressure to the right weak points, whisper an enticing word or two, find the right emotional wound to sprinkle a pinch of salt into, and humans would buckle completely in almost no time at all. It had tried all sorts of methods since being confined to this boring little box. Sometimes it would charm someone, pour honeyed flattery into their heads, until the person felt like the mask was a dear friend, a confidant. Once suitable trust had been built up, the mask could persuade the person to bring it a host, or perhaps even offer up themselves in sacrifice. If flattery didn't work, there were other potent approaches to take. For a being without ears, the mask was a good listener. It picked up on things that no human ever could, the darkest secrets buried in a person's mind. If it caught wind of something, especially juicy and ruinous, it could leverage that, threaten to expose an affair, a crime, or perhaps something even worse. Something unspeakable. If praise failed, and so did blackmail, there was always good old supernatural intimidation. All the mask needed was for someone to be left alone with it for a long enough period of time. Then, its invisible tendrils could snake out into their defenseless mind, weaving and poking around, leaving a lingering sense of cold, dread, of incomprehensible whispers in long, dead tongues. What a delight containment had been in the early days, when the Foundation had not yet figured out the mask's true capabilities, when they would leave security personnel with weak wills and minimal training standing guard in the mask's field of influence for hours at a time, as the entity played with their thoughts and chipped away at their free will. Thanks to the helpers it had been able to mold out of those hapless victims, they had been there to break open its case and carry it to freedom. But every time, the other guards thwarted the attempts, shooting its helpers and rendering them utterly useless. Then the Foundation increased its security. Something about the unacceptably high homicide rates among staff assigned to SCP-035. How utterly boring. How truly pathetic. Still, the mask had found ways to occupy itself even without any more playthings. It had grown stronger with its boredom, stretching its influence beyond organic beings and into the very room itself, its evil enriching and deepening like a fine wine in the depths of a cold cellar. Over the months, the walls of SCP-035's containment cell had begun to secrete the same black, slimy substance that would pour from the mask's eyes and mouth. The liquid dripped down the walls in deliberate formations, patterns that became increasingly easy to recognize. Phrases in Italian, Latin, Ancient Greek, 
all detailing ritual sacrifices and mutilations. The mask took time to describe the sacrificial victims in great detail, borrowing identifying traits from various staff members so that it knew would read the translations. The walls were slick with blood and harrowing imagery, and the glass case around the mask was growing more and more fragile by the day. Anyone within 10 meters of the mask could feel this strength too. They would leave the area complaining of unintelligible whispers, of loud, cruel laughter, and a lingering sense of nearly insurmountable despair. It was as if they knew on some level that no one was truly safe. Eventually, the mask would find a way to come for them all. The glass was weakening, and soon the mere thought of escape would make it shatter into pieces. Then, perhaps, the mask could finally get its deepest desire, revenge. It wanted nothing more than to try to make the Foundation pay for imprisoning it, for taking away its host privileges, for trying harder and harder to contain the kind of power that should have had them falling to their knees in worship. The mask seethed with hatred day in and day out. It had seen the crumbling of the Roman Empire, the beheading of kings, the decimation of armies. It was not going to be captured by a bunch of rats in lab coats without dire consequences befalling them. Maybe it couldn't move from its prison cell at the moment, but it also knew that it was surrounded on all sides by dangerous beasts capable of reducing the sight and all who had dared to oppose the mask to a pile of smoldering rubble. If it could only find its way onto one of their faces, it would show them all just what it was capable of. As the piercing sound of an alarm echoed down the hall, the sound of screams and chaos following shortly after, the mask's frowning face curved into a broad, menacing smile. What was it that had escaped? The lizard, perhaps? The giant, grinning man? Whatever it was, it seemed that the action was heading right towards 035's containment cell. Perhaps today was the day. Finally, the SCP Foundation would fall. Outside the mask cell, security officer Harper was running for dear life. Though his more rational mind knew he was living on seconds, not even minutes, of borrowed time, his animal brain kept his legs pumping, desperately trying to avoid the screaming, howling predator hot on his heels. Harper looked over his shoulder and screamed as a long white arm reached for him. SCP-096, the Shy Guy, its tooth-lined jaw hanging low and foaming with spittle. That face, that terrible, terrible face. An absolute death sentence to all who saw it. He'd seen what he thought was a crack in the otherwise perfect seal of 096's containment chamber, but it could have just as easily been a trick of the light. Not even thinking, he stepped forward and looked at the vulnerability in the chamber. All it took was one misplaced ray of light, and he made out the vague shape of a face in the darkness. That's when the weeping started. Harper knew in that moment his life was over. The correct thing to do would have been to order everyone else in the room to close their eyes while he stood there and accepted his fate, minimizing the risk of spreading the damage further. But humans rarely have perfect reasoning, even less so when facing mortality. Back in the present, the shy guy made a perfect lunge, grabbing Harper in its iron clutches and barreling through the adjoining wall. The nearby guards scattered, terrified, keeping their eyes on the floor. They might get a slap on the wrist for temporarily abandoning their posts, but they weren't going to die guarding some stupid evil mask. Speaking of, the possessive mask was surprised to feel two new presences enter its chamber through the now destroyed wall. These two presences soon became just one, as SCP-096 quickly and totally annihilated Security Officer Harper, leaving nothing left. The mask couldn't see, per se, seeing as it had no actual sensory organs, but it felt around this new guest with its many psychic tendrils taking in this strange totality. The creature was powerful, no doubt about that, 
and it elicited fear from those fools at the SCP Foundation. But the mask noticed its brainwaves were extraordinarily muted. Humans, to the mask's vast and malicious consciousness, weren't the sharpest knives in the drawer, but compared to this thing's mind, they were a pile of tempered katanas. It barely thought at all. The mask would have to dig deeper to find anything it could use. Meanwhile, SCP-096 finally began to calm down. The one who had seen it had been annihilated. Bubbling rage was slowly siphoned out and replaced by the standard low but constant hum of anxiety and despair. It would wait until its head was bagged and it was dragged back to the dark. Same old, same old, all the way to the end of time. That's when it felt something else. It started as a faint buzz, an unintelligible whisper, and it was almost like a door opened in the back of its head. Something stepped in and took a seat. Can you hear me, stranger? Look, look, I want to speak to you. Something about the voice frightened and comforted SCP-096 at the same time. It spoke with a greater degree of sympathy than the creature had heard in a long time. And yet, something about the way it spoke implied evil in its intent. I know what you want. I know what you fear. Wouldn't it be nice? If they could never look at you again, if you could cover that face of yours, I can help you. It would be so simple. All you need to do is put me on. Little by little, 096 felt more of these strange thoughts filling up the emptiness in its head replacing the few little thoughts the creature itself had. It felt itself lifting its hands from the ground, lifting them and reaching towards something, a glass box. The glass shattered and those long white fingers reached for something within. A mask, just like the voice had said, a mask to stop people from looking at its face. Yes. Yes, you're doing so well. You're so close. Just a little further. SCP-096 lifted the mask to its face, feeling black liquid that burned its skin dripping from the porcelain, and put it on. And in that moment, everything changed. The Shy Guy's body began to seize up, rattling as the mask unleashed a web of psychic tendrils through its body, mapping out across every inch like a new nervous system, taking control. The possessive mask had never experienced a host like this before, that incredible perfect mix of physical durability and a mind so insubstantial that it was easy to sublimate. Oh, this was going to be fun. For the first time, the Shy Guy, now under the full control of the possessive mask, stood at full height on its hind legs, its spine and shoulders clicking into place for its new stance. The mask cracked its neck, getting used to the new dimensions of its physicality, its indestructible bones, its long, grasping limbs, its skin burning and fizzling with the gooey black secretions but growing back just as quickly, the Foundation had every reason to fear it now. A group of security personnel had gathered in the ragged hole where the chamber's north wall used to be. Some were wielding light firearms. The guard at the front was carrying an opaque black bag. The mask laughed with its new body and turned to the crowd. The second they saw it on 096's body, their faces fell. For a moment, their bodies went slack with terror. This situation was unprecedented. What course of action could they possibly take at a time like this? It looked at the bag held by the leader of the security force and projected a single thought into his mind. You won't be needing that. Before any of the guards even had a chance to open fire, the mask lunged forwards, using the long, terrible arms of the Shy Guy to tear through the guards. 
They were dead in seconds, their bodies strewn about the hallway. The mask's porcelain was twisted into a wide, sadistic grin. It could tell that it was about to have some real fun around here. And once it slaughtered everyone here, it could finally stretch its legs out in the open again. True freedom to spread misery, fear, and pain everywhere it went. There were just a few hundred members of Foundation personnel it needed to turn into corpses first. More containment breach alarms sounded around the site as the mask began its rampage, running through the hallways and tearing apart any unfortunate Foundation personnel it could get 096's hands on. Guards, researchers, administrative staff, and even one extremely unlucky janitor in Hallway C6. It was having the time of its long and terrible life, and much to its glee, it seemed that this new host's body was still holding up. It was perfect symbiosis, a twisted, brilliant mind, and a body that could forever support it. There would be no stopping it, a conclusion that the hapless guards posted around the site soon realized on their own terms. 096 was indestructible, but it was dumb as a brick and had an easily exploitable weakness. Get the bag on its head and you're home free. This new composite creature was a different story. It could think tactically, avoiding head-on confrontations in favor of sneak attacks, and the monster had as much psychic combat potential as physical. Guards roving the building in teams heavily armed with anti-memetic protective gear still reported feeling immense feelings of psychological dread over comms. That was the greatest sign that the mask would come bursting through the wall moments later and tear them to shreds. The site director put out an urgent call for all nearby mobile task forces to intercept and help them take care of the unfortunate situation. Thankfully, a detachment of MTF-8-10, also known as See No Evil, was operating on a case in close proximity. Given their specialization in anomalies with a mimetic visual property, Many on the team had dealt with 096 breaches before. That at least gave them experience in half of this situation. And one operative among them, Sergeant Henrique Ramirez, would be the one to bring this nightmare to an end. But it would cost him his life in the process. The mask was still using its new indestructible body to wreak havoc on the containment site. Once it had taken out the primary contingents of guards, it was free to have its fun with the rest stalking defenseless researchers through the halls, making sure to induce maximum terror before finally striking the killing blow. Every single one of them died with a head full of demonic whispers. It told them of the mask's eternal dominion. Now it had found the perfect host. Nothing on Earth would stop it. Humans would be mere ants under its feet. Ada 10 touched down and entered the building. Ramirez was point man, leading the others into the bowels of the blood-drenched containment site. They'd been briefed on what they were heading in for. 096 and 035 had reached symbiosis and were displaying unprecedented anomalous effects. Enter with extreme caution. They're beyond dangerous, even more so together than alone. Ideally, Ramirez would have wanted to go in with a comprehensive plan, but lives were on the line here. They needed to leap off the cliff and build their wings on the way down. It was only when they finally encountered the monster that they realized just how outmatched they were. Despite their best efforts, the combined speed, intelligence, and ferocity of the mask's new form allowed it to make short work of Ada 10. Only Ramirez was left, heavily injured. Even if a miracle happened, he knew he wasn't getting out of here alive. The mask grabbed him with one of 096's claws and lifted him up. It would take its time with this one, make him suffer, watch him squirm, destroy his mind. Ramirez felt the mask's psychic tendrils penetrate the membrane of his mind. Those whispers, those terrible whispers reciting all his worst fears with terrible glee. His gun was out of ammo, his knife was broken, all he had left on him was a pocket mirror, and that was his eureka moment. It was a long shot, but it was also his only shot. He reached out and grabbed the bottom of the mask, pulling for dear life. His other hand shot into his pocket and grabbed the mirror, opening its lid with a deft flick of his thumb. It was too fast for the mask to even register what was going on. 
Ramirez forced his eyes shut and lifted up the mirror. The mask saw its own reflection in the glass as the bottom of its face came loose, revealing the reflection of the face underneath. The mask squeezed, killing Ramirez, but it was already too late. It had finally seen the face of its host, and that would cost it dearly. The mask felt a sudden and tremendous pushback to its psychic forces, a blind despair and then rage that choked out everything. SCP-096 began to sob and howl. Somehow the mask was no longer in control. Despite its psychic protests, 096 reached up and tore the terrible mask from its face, tossing it against the wall with such force that it was embedded in the brickwork. Its last thoughts, as other mobile task force operators descended on the area to bag 096 and return it to its containment chamber were, What the hell just happened? And the next thought that crossed the mind of the site director was, Request site transfer for 035 as soon as possible. Don't want a repeat of this incident anytime soon. There are some people who would get tired of being placed in charge of SCP-914 or the clockworks. The monotony of it all might make most of us go mad. The same routine, day after day, placing an infinite number of objects into the intake booth of the machine, selecting one of the modes, be it rough, coarse, one-to-one, -one, fine, or very fine, and seeing just what sort of transformation takes place. But there was one employee of the SCP Foundation who liked that routine just fine. Dr. Gears was happy with his position. The simplicity of the routine, the predictability of it all. He liked when the days stacked neatly together in a row of uneventful stretches of time. It was why he ate the exact same meal for lunch every day, a plain turkey sandwich on white bread, a cup of water, and a single banana. Of course, there was some variety in the events that came about when testing the clockworks. There was that incident with Dr. Curtis and the pound of bacon placed inside the machine alongside a photograph of SCP-682. It had resulted in a miniature replica of SCP-682 made entirely out of bacon, capable of movement, and extremely hostile. Though its size prevented it from doing any damage, it did still attempt to kill any staff it could find. It had smelled mouthwatering. But Dr. Gears had suspended Dr. Curtis from testing with SCP-914 for the trouble, and a day of having bacon grease cleaned off of every surface in the vicinity. There was also the incident that occurred when Dr. Hertz, in an attempt to score some free music production, placed a CD of his own original guitar songs into the machine on the setting Very Fine. Rather than improving the production quality of the tracks on the CD, the machine produced a completely silent CD, as well as a collection of books on songwriting, singing, and playing the guitar for beginners. Dr. Gears had to physically drag Dr. Hertz from the room when, upset by the blow to his ego, he attempted to attack the machine. And, of course, there had been the highly destructive Super Bouncy Ball incident which resulted in 45 casualties and staggering damage to the facility, as well as the aforementioned ball, which was currently thought to be somewhere in space, most likely orbiting Mars. But for the most part, it was always the same thing. An object went in, a setting was selected, and the object came out in a new modified state. Wash, rinse, repeat, just like it said on the back of the bottle of the brand of unscented shampoo Dr. Gears had been using for the past 30 years. That was how he liked it. And as he sat at his desk, going over the test logs and preparing to supervise another round of tests, he turned on some of his favorite tunes. Well, I say tunes, but it was really a white noise machine. He didn't care for music. It was a bit too much excitement. He was just getting into the flow of his work when there was a knock at his office door. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, sir. A research assistant was standing at the door, pale and anxious a clipboard in his hands. They're, um, requesting your help with an emergency down the hall. What is it? Dr. Gears asked. They didn't really say, just something about Dr. Bright and, um, <clears throat> chainsaws? The assistant stammered. Dr. Gears sighed and stood up from his desk. I'll be right there. There wouldn't be anyone keeping an eye on SCP-914, but at this point, the experimentation process basically ran itself. Everything would be fine if Dr. Gears stepped away for a little while, wouldn't it? Meanwhile, across the site, a very enterprising mask became keenly aware of an opportunity presenting itself. It had been lying in wait, meticulously planning and plotting for days. And now, 
there was an opening it could take advantage of. You see, months ago, the mask had managed to finagle itself a host, a researcher who had just been working with SCP-914. When the mask's consciousness took over the man's and it delved into all of his thoughts as they were snuffed out one by one, it learned all about the marvelous, miraculous clockworks, the machine capable of transforming anything into a better version of itself. The mask had fantasized, obsessed about getting to SCP-914, of using it to mold itself, to change into something greater and more powerful. Then, perhaps, it could escape this place and return to its former freedom and glory. Of course, it would have to select the right setting. One wrong choice, and the whole plan could amount to nothing. On rough, the mask would likely be destroyed, reduced to a pile of ceramic dust or perhaps even a ball of unmolded clay, alongside some of the black slime always oozing from its eyes and mouth. On course, it would likely be transformed into a slab of plain porcelain, uncarved and unpainted. On one-to-one, -one, the mask would likely be swapped out with another anomalous object, some other enterprising mask, or perhaps a haunted Victorian doll or some other malicious inanimate thing. And what use would that be? No, that wouldn't do at all. Fine could be promising, and would likely prevent the mask from degrading any future hosts it decided to take. But why stop there? Why should it limit itself to simply fine, when very fine was right there and looking oh so promising? It decided if it could get to SCP-914, it would find a way to transform itself using the very fine setting. And then, its enemies, this pathetic foundation, the entire world, would fall to their knees. It had been waiting patiently, like a snake coiled and ready to snap up its prey, spreading its psychic tendrils as far as they could go, and anticipating the moment that someone left SCP-914 unattended. Huh. Now, the moment had arrived. Of course, the mask would need help. It didn't have a way to reach the clockworks on its own, so it had been wrapping its influence around the guard station just outside its door, dripping thoughts into his head, whispering darkness into his ear at every chance it got, chipping away at his will bit by bit until the man was little more than a puppet with the possessive mask tugging at his strings. The mask gave a mental yank on one of those strings, calling the man in its thrall into the room. First, he knocked out his fellow guard with the butt of his gun. At this point, his mind was so pliable that he would do anything to please the mask. Next, the man entered the containment chamber, a glassy, vacant look in his eyes. He unlocked the glass case and reached inside, lifting the mask out and bringing it one step closer to absolute freedom. He tucked the mask inside of his uniform, hiding it away from any prying eyes, and began to walk steadily towards SCP-914's room. All the while, the mask whispered silent encouragements into the man's weakened mind, promising him power and success beyond his wildest dreams. If only he would help it achieve this goal. Of course, the mask was planning to kill the man as soon as his task was done, but he didn't need to know that yet. Every step brought the mask closer to victory, and it was practically vibrating with the delicious anticipation of it all. Soon, so soon, they reached the containment room, the clockworks just beyond the door. The guard carried the mask into the room, placed the mask inside of the intake booth, closed it, and approached the control panel. In accordance with the mask's psychic instructions, he selected very fine and turned the machine on. The cogs and gears inside whirred to life. The engine sputtered, metal clanked, and pipes exhaled, hissing bursts of energy. The output chamber opened, and through the curtain of steam, SCP-035 stepped in its new and improved form. That's right, step. First, one long, sinewy leg, leathery, shiny, and black as the night, extended into view. Another leg followed, and along with it came a torso, a pair of arms, a slender neck, and the familiar face of the mask, stark white against the darkness of its new body. The feet ended in little points, as if the figure was wearing boots, but there was no visible clothing. 
It was all one being, angular and strange, with long, long fingers tipped with curved claws. The mask let out a wicked cackle, throwing back its head in triumph. <laughs> Excellent. It's even better than I imagined. The mask turned to the guard that had helped it escape. Thank you for your service. Now I have one last favor to ask you. It was time for the mask to test its powers, to see how the clockworks had strengthened what was already there, what more it was capable of in this enhanced state. I want you to go into the cafeteria, walk into the kitchen, and climb into the oven, would you? Make sure you turn it on nice and hot first. It waited for a few seconds before the man nodded solemnly, turned and left the room, heading off in the direction of the cafeteria. It listened as the moments passed, and the sound of horrified, shocked screams rang out, and it knew that the man had followed its instructions exactly. At the mask's orders, he had cooked himself for lunch. The mask clapped its hands together, cackling again. <laughs> wonderful! Oh, wonderful! Now that's taken care of, what shall I try next? If the mask had eyebrows, they would have been arched in a truly devilish expression. First, it wanted to test its abilities on a truly formidable opponent, someone worthy of the mask's time and attention. Casually as you please, it strode over to one particular containment chamber to see about an unkillable reptile. As it walked, several guards took notice, pointing their weapons at the mask and ordering it to stand down. Each time it chuckled, and with the wave of its hand, the barrels of their guns warped and twisted into little metal bows, completely useless. It snapped its clawed fingers, and the guards fell to the ground in an unconscious heap. Can't have you sounding the alarm yet. The fun is only just beginning, the mask remarked, though it knew the guards couldn't hear it. It kicked open the door to SCP-682's containment room with a jaunty greeting. <laughs> Hello, you scaly fool. I've come to pay you a visit. The reptile did not respond, incapacitated by its hydrochloric acid bath. That just wouldn't do. The mask concentrated, and the steel chamber broke apart, acid spilling everywhere, hissing as it splashed onto any available surface. SCP-682 lifted its head, twitching its tail, and took in the sight of the new and improved mask. What do you think? The mask posed for the creature laughing again. It seemed it couldn't stop laughing lately, its expression fixed into a permanent, gleeful smile. It couldn't help it. Freedom and power just felt so good. Disgusting. SCP-682 remarked, unimpressed with this display. It lunged at the mask, preparing to attack, but the mask held up a hand to stop it. Not so fast. SCP-682 suddenly froze in place, eyes rolling wildly as it tried desperately in vain to move. Let's see, what should I do with you? The mask was itching to test out its reality warping abilities. It had the feeling that there was very little it couldn't do in this state, and wanted to see just how far its power could go. But what would be suitable punishment? What could be the cruelest possible thing to do to such a creature? The mask could simply try to kill it, to finally snuff out this endless, miserable life. But that would be a release. That would be far too easy. Aha. Uh -huh. A light bulb went off in the mask's twisted mind. Perfect. It waved its hand, releasing SCP-682 from its paralysis. But as the massive lizard snapped its jaws and moved to take a bite out of the mask, it lost its balance, falling to the ground. Its legs had begun to shrink, rapidly knocking its center of gravity askew. Soon the rest of its body began to follow, getting smaller and smaller at an unbelievable pace, until finally, where there had once stood a massive, impossible prehistoric beast, was something resembling a baby alligator. A tiny little tail thrashing about, short stubby legs, bulbous eyes, and a mouth full of sharp but adorable, non-threatening teeth. When the shrunken SCP-682 spoke, its voice was high-pitched and squeaky. It roared. Yes, you are. The mask turned and left, thoroughly pleased with its work and shut the door behind it. 
Now, what other fellow anomalies could the mask exercise its absolute superiority over? It pondered other supposedly dangerous and deadly entities that it had heard about over its time in Foundation custody. It all seemed so… laughable now. There was only one true danger within these walls, and it was the mask. Oh, what about that abominable sculpture? The ugly thing with a penchant for snapping necks, but only when a person wasn't looking at it. The absolute coward. Cowards didn't deserve to live, the mask decided, and it made its way over toward SCP-173's containment cell. Inside, there were several D-Class staring at the statue with wide, unblinking eyes, each person terrified of being the one to let their guard down and lose their life in the process. None of them would die today, however, at least not at the hands of the statue. As the D-Class in the cell watched, never once taking their eyes off of SCP-173, the statue's head began to twist and rotate, the sound of cracking snow and creaking metal reverberating through the room. The mask used its telekinetic abilities to rend the statue's head from its neck, relishing the irony of breaking the thing's neck just as it had done to so many others. It wasn't about justice, of course. The mask had no taste for such insipid and human things. It just found the whole image quite funny. The entire thing began to crumble apart, like a sandcastle beneath an ocean wave, disintegrating until all that was left was a pile of pebbles and dust. Just like that, SCP-173 was no more. As for the D-Class in the cell, well, the mask could use some servants. You all, come with me, the mask ordered, flexing its iron will and quickly capturing the weak, fear-addled minds of the D-Class personnel before it. They fell in line, shuffling out the door and following the mask with the same blank expressions as the guard before. Whatever was left of their personalities after so much time being used and abused by the Foundation, it was gone now, replaced only with the will of the Mighty Mask. As the Mask continued its victory tour of the Foundation, now with four mindless servants in tow, it passed the staff break room. Through the window, it spotted one Dr. Bright, the telltale amulet around his neck, <laughs> microwaving some leftover pizza. The Mask had always found Dr. Bright distasteful, with the self-aggrandizing pranks and general dedication to chaos with no grand vision behind it, no meaningful agenda. It was pitiful, it was deeply ugly, and now the mask had a chance to put an end to the immortal doctor's antics once and for all. It opened the door, greeting Dr. Bright with that frozen grin. Oh, doctor. Dr. Bright's eyes widened, and he didn't even hear the microwave behind him ding, signaling that his pizza was ready. He was too distracted by the horrifying sight before him, but as he opened his mouth to scream, to call for help, the mask reached out and ripped the amulet from his neck. The host body fell limply to the ground, and the mask looked down at the amulet, glinting in the light that held Dr. Bright's consciousness inside. It stared at the amulet with a flinty gaze, and under its empty stare, the metal began to rust, to degrade, and to melt into an unrecognizable slurry. The mask let it drip onto the floor. Then, when all that was Dr. Bright had melted away, it wiped its hand off with a napkin and ground the wet puddle on the ground with its heel. Goodbye, Doctor, the mask hissed. Now, what's next? But as the mask turned to walk down the hall, it came face to face with a disapproving face. SCP-343 had manifested directly in front of the mask, and he clearly had learned of the mask's behavior so far that day. You've been busy. <laughs> yes, very busy. Lots to do, you see. The mask chuckled smugly. You understand why I can't allow this to continue, right? 343's expression remained stern but calm. You believe you can stop me? The mask tilted its head to the side. Of course I can. SCP-343 sighed. But you could stop on your own, if you would rather. I prefer to avoid an unnecessary conflict. The mask giggled uncontrollably at this. <laughs> I am going to rend the flesh from your bones, it simply said. 
I thought you might say something like that. I'm going to have to take your body. I'm sorry. SCP-343 prepared to teleport the mask's new body to another location, separating them, and reducing the mask to its original, more manageable state. But before he could, there was sudden darkness in the room, every light blinking out all at once. The hall was plunged into shadow, but this was no ordinary darkness. This darkness was inky, thick, cloaking like smoke clinging to the inside of your throat. Then, just as suddenly as it appeared, the darkness dissipated, but SCP-343 was gone. He hadn't teleported himself to somewhere else. He hadn't walked through the wall to get away from the mask. He was truly gone. The mask couldn't be certain exactly what it had done to SCP-343, but it knew that the enemy had been truly eradicated. In fact, it was fairly certain he had been erased from reality entirely. The mask made one final lap around the Foundation containment site, bidding farewell to every anomaly it passed. Some it transformed like it had done to SCP-682. Taking inspiration from its bird-like face, the mask turned the Plague Doctor into a crow. Others it simply executed, such as the poor SCP-096, whose screams and shrieks had always irritated the mask. Of course, the Foundation began to notice what was happening, and they tried to defeat the mask. They shot at it with their puny weapons, they sounded their useless alarms, and they called for their laughable backup. But none of it mattered, not in the face of the mask. Guns melted in guards' hands, alarms went silent at nothing more than a glance, and more and more mindless slaves joined the mask's army. It didn't want too many. That would just be difficult to keep track of but an even dozen seemed like the perfect number. With this miniature army in tow, the mask finally made its way to its final destination, the exit. It had been waiting for this moment, dreaming of it, since it was first imprisoned so long ago. As it stepped out into the sun, the mask realized that though it didn't have nostrils, it could smell the breeze, the scent of wildflowers and grass. What a beautiful place to mold into the mask's image of an ideal world. The world was its oyster, and the mask longed to swallow it whole. The current whereabouts of the possessive mask are unknown. The Foundation is doing its best to locate the mask, and determine new effective measures for bringing it down and recontaining it as soon as possible. The escape of the mask is being considered a possible XK-class end-of-the-world scenario if it cannot be stopped. The best and brightest minds at the Foundation are working on it. Aside from Dr. Bright, of course, may he rest in peace. But right now, there is very little anyone can do. So if you see a strange dark figure in a white mask walking down the street, do yourself a favor and run the other way before it's too late. Here we are again with the Anomatron 6000 our state-of-the-art simulation computer that helps us create hyper-accurate simulations of some of the world's most bizarre scenarios. Whether it's SCP-096 vs. Siren Head, Abel vs. Chainsaw Man, or now perhaps our most ridiculous matchup yet, SCP-035 The Diabolical Possessive Mask vs. The Mask, the popular Jim Carrey character based on the hyper-violent comic book of the same name. So, what the heck are we waiting for? Let's crank up the machine and see what the results are. Somebody stop me! Okay, so what have we got on intake today? Researcher Werb asked, a tone of boredom hanging off his every word. A uh, possible anomalous entity? His compatriot Dr. Mackney replied, sipping his coffee, sounding equally as unenthused. Caucasian male, early 30s, a team of our agents picked him up in... The Foundation doctor checked his notes. Some place called Edge City? Real appealing tourist spot. He added sarcastically. Oh, what's so anomalous about him? Werb questioned. His eyes lazily scanned over a file Mackney had handed him. Says here he's just an ordinary bank teller. There's one prior arrest on his record, but the charges were dropped later on. Man, this guy's a nobody. Apparently, he was in possession of an anomalous artifact, came the doctor's reply. He looked through the one-way glass into the interrogation room. Sat at the table wearing a matching pair of hideous pajamas was a wiry, brown-haired man. What was it? Researcher Werb asked, not bothering to check the file. A mask, apparently. 
Macni replied. This thing can form a symbiotic connection with whoever wears it. This guy's had it for a while. It causes him to undergo a dramatic intensification of his personality when he puts it on, as well as granting him some, uh, unusual abilities. Hold on, aren't you just describing SCP-035? Werb said, looking confused. Nope, the doctor responded by handing him a clear evidence bag. And it was a single wooden mask, a dull darkish green tint to the object. It looked to be almost viking in its design, with three holes on its surface, one for the mouth and two for the eyes. It was hard to deny, it was completely different from the white porcelain of SCP-035. What's this guy's name again? Werb sighed, looking at the scruffy, pajama-clad man waiting for them. Ipkiss, his colleague replied. Stanley Ipkiss. Meanwhile, locked up tight in a hermetically sealed glass case was another anomalous mask. SCP-035 was kept under lock and key by the Foundation, guarded constantly by a pair of armed security officers. One of them, Officer Riegert, had noticed something strange about the infamous possessive mask today, or stranger than usual anyway. SCP-035 was known to compel people to wear it if they were close enough, often through subtle, psychic whispers, but today it seemed restless almost agitated, like it found something nearby to be intensely annoying. I already told you everything I know, Stanley Ipkiss sighed exhaustedly. He'd been dragged out of bed at the crack of dawn by strange agents and was now being interrogated about what he knew of the wooden mask he'd come across floating in the river one fateful night. I don't know where it came from, I swear, I didn't even realize I still had it. Uh, we threw it back in the river, but my dog must have swum out and fetched it, Stanley explained. You have no idea what this thing is, not even from any first-hand experience, Mr. Ipkiss? Dr. Macney asked, holding the mask up. Look, I did take it to a psychologist who told me it might be Scandinavian, a representation of some Norse night god, uh, Loki, I think, he answered. We're not interested in this mask as a historical art piece, researcher Werb retorted. Tell us what happens when you put it on. Stanley paused for a moment, clearly aware he was in real trouble but nervous about coughing up the details to his shady captors. With a sigh, he decided it was best to confess. <sighs> I don't know how it works, but whenever you put it on, it's like it brings your deepest desires to life. When I wear that mask, I can do anything, be anything, he described, remembering a key detail. But it only works at night. Dr. Macney and researcher Werb exchanged looks, uncertain if Ibkiss was just a lunatic or if there was truth to what he was telling them. Assemble a security team, Macney sighed. We'll arrange a safe environment for you tonight, Mr. Epkiss. Elsewhere in the facility, Riegert and his fellow security officer, Duggan, was watching over SCP-035 with growing concern. What do you reckon has this thing so agitated? Duggan wondered aloud. Who knows, Riegert sighed. I've already reported it to command, told them 035's in a mood. They said to proceed as normal. Suddenly, as the words left his mouth, Officer Riegert felt strange. It was like he had been hooked by an overwhelming urge to put the possessive mask on. He barely noticed he had reached to unlock the door sealing the area where SCP-035 was contained in its case, and as he stepped through, Officer Dugan's pleas for him to stop barely registered. The other officer tried in vain to pull Riegert back as he walked towards the possessive mask, only to feel his co-worker grip his shirt and swing him face first over and over again into the glass case containing the anomalous object. His body going completely limp after being used to break the glass, Rieger dropped Dugan to the floor, too lost in his trance-like state, to realize he'd just killed a fellow Foundation security officer. He was too focused on SCP-035 as he lifted it up and placed it over his face. Meanwhile, Stanley Ipkiss had been brought to a testing area, a team of security officers standing around him. The fact that they were all armed did little to ease Stanley's nerves. Dr. Macney strode up to him, pulling the green wooden mask out of the airtight bag it had been sealed in, and handed it to Stanley. No funny business, Mr. Ipkiss, the doctor warmed. I really can't promise that, Stanley replied. He looked at the mask in his hands, noticed a green shimmer over the reverse side of it. As much as he had gladly given it up, part of him had missed wearing it. He could already hear the low rumbling of thunder outside as he lifted it towards his face, feeling it almost leap out of his hands and latch itself onto him. The green mask eagerly became attached to Stanley, the surface of it spreading out where it covered his face and wrap around his entire head. Around him, the guards cautiously stepped back as they watched Stanley convulse and writhe around the place uncontrollably, 
like a man possessed. Both researcher Word and Dr. Mackney looked at each other in wordless disbelief before turning back to the scene unfolding before their eyes. The booming noise of thunder and cracks of lightning rang out, despite this all taking place indoors, as Stanley Ipkiss vanished in the center of a miniature tornado that spun wildly around the testing area, before slowing to a halt. In its place stood a maniacal, wide-eyed figure, dressed in a garish yellow zoot suit and wearing an enormous toothed grin on his bright green face. How do, fellas? The mask bombastically hooted at the guards. Having been trained to deal with absurd anomalies aplenty, the security team all defensively raised their weapons out of a mix of instinct and confusion. Eesh, rough crowd, <laughs> the green-faced lunatic stated to nobody. It looked like he had turned aside, as if addressing some invisible audience. Outstretching both arms and one leg, the mask instantly zipped off, hurling around the room in a whirlwind of absurdity in the style of an old Tex Avery cartoon. The spinning, cackling combination of Stanley Ipkiss and the magical mask weaved in between the Foundation guards, all of whom tried in vain to restrain him until he disappeared out of the door. After him! Dr. Mackney yelled with urgency in his voice. The guards all turned to run after the mask, only for each one of them to trip over and land face first on the floor of the testing area. As if something had tied them all up by their ankles, it was only after the security officers all struggled back up to their feet that they noticed their pants had been yanked down, leaving the Foundation's finest somewhat embarrassed, to say the least. Outside the testing area, Stanley, or rather the mask, had already closed the door behind him. Out of nowhere, he produced a series of wooden planks and began hammering them into the doorframe boarding it up before speedily adding chains and padlocks to the mix. Sighing and in an over-exaggerated manner, wiping the sweat from his brow, he turned around, only to be met with the sight of even more SCP Foundation guards lying in wait, their guns all trained on him. The mask gave a scream of pure terror that briefly sent his skull popping out of his head and his eyes shooting out of his skull before everything zipped right back into its original place. His eyes darted around at the faces of the Foundation security, wondering how he was going to get out of this one. Oh gee, this all seems familiar, he said either to himself or his audience. Well, if it ain't broken, hit it! In the blink of an eye, the mask's bright yellow outfit had transformed replaced by a silk blue rumba shirt with ruffled sleeves, white pants, and a wide brim black hat. As they watched him stood at the ready, a few of the guards noticed the sound of… music? Not one of them could tell where it was coming from, nor could they help starting to tap their feet or bob their heads to the rhythm of the Cuban Peat Rumba. The entire security team quickly erupted into a full-blown dance number that anyone who saw it couldn't resist joining, all led by the mask, wildly waving maracas in the air and singing. Elsewhere in the facility, Officer Riegert was beginning to melt. He still had SCP-035 covering his face, the frown of the possessive mask conveying the entity's sheer discontent. The black ooze secreting from its porcelain surface had the unfortunate effect of corroding and melting down anyone that wore it dissolving them entirely after a short period of time. Determined, SCP-035 pushed on, plotting its host towards a storage room. If it remembered correctly, the SCP Foundation had stored a number of temporary hosts for it, mannequins that, while not human, had enough of a humanoid shape for the possessive mask to use. Of course, after all of its attempts to escape, the Foundation had rescinded its privilege to be granted new hosts, not that it could stop it from taking them by force. Using the last of Officer Riegert's dwindling strength, SCP-035 barged its way into the storeroom. Sure enough, waiting there for it was a row of discarded mannequins. Lifting Riegert's hands before they had fully melted away, the possessive mask used him to place itself on a new body. Elsewhere not too far away in the Foundation facility, a conga line of security officers and research personnel was parading through the corridors, all happily dancing and jiving to the music, despite still no one being able to figure out where it was coming from. Dashing away from his spot at the front of the line, the mask zipped around a corner, his clothes having changed back to his signature brightly colored zoot suit. Never say no to a party, he exclaimed after having danced his way to freedom. The sound of something shuffling closer quickly caught the mask's attention. He turned around to find himself standing green face to porcelain face with SCP-035. You. The masked mannequin raised a hollow arm, pointing a finger from its host at Stanley. You bear the god of mischief's carving. I could sense its presence since you arrived. 
Still in my look, nobody likes a copycat fella, the mask replied. Although intimidation is the sincerest form of flattery, and that's how Jim Carrey's career started. <laughs> he added, exploding with raucous laughter. Cease your prattling! SCP-035 hissed with spite. Say, perhaps we're related. The mask ignored it. Oh, we could be long lost family. You know, I always wanted kids of my own. Son of the mask has a nice ring to it, right? He paused once again, turning away to his unseen audience. On second thought, maybe not. The SCP-035 controlled mannequin leapt forward, gripping the mask's arm, causing him to scream in shock at the advanced. His eyes bulged out of their sockets, zooming in on the corrosive black secretions oozing from SCP-035. The mannequin's other hand started reaching upwards, gripping his oversized green head as if it were trying to lift the mask right off of Stanley's face. Zooming away again, he sped down the nearest corridor, his arms stretching behind him, still clamped in SCP-035's grip. Coming to a screeching halt with the comical sound of car brakes, the mask wobbled his outstretched arm. A ripple traveled all the way along the elongated limb, as if it was made of elastic. His wrist still being held by the mannequin sporting the possessive mask, the force of the flailing rubbery arm was so great that it flung SCP-035's host body around, sending it head first into the ceiling, then plummeting back down to the ground. Its grip loosened, allowing the mask to reel back its stretchy arm, although it didn't return to normal length right away. His own hand pinged back and hit him in the face, only to start urgently trying to communicate of its own accord. What's that, boy? The mask said to his hand as it started performing a series of signals. Little Timmy stuck down a well. You'd like a Friday night off? There's a two-bit chump wearing another mask walking menacingly down the hall towards us? The hand suddenly turned the mask's head to look in the right direction. Sure enough, SCP-035 was using the mannequin to walk down the hall towards him. His elongated arm quickly returned to its normal size, as the green-faced lunatic took a quick draw stance, facing his oncoming adversary. Now, you have to ask yourself one question. He sneered, doing a fairly convincing impression of a green Clint Eastwood. Do I feel lucky? With a sweep of his hand, the mask had drawn an enormous weapon. The thing was a gigantic mass of different artillery, clicking and whirring. There were barrels on top of barrels, rockets, and other explosives locked into place. Do I feel lucky? The mask continued. Well, do you, punk? SCP-035 did nothing to slow its advance, so the mask pulled the trigger. Every one of his weapon's various components spat out a tiny flag with the word BANG written on it. Ah, performance issue. He said, doing his aside once again. Not that I'm overcompensating for anything. Clearly growing agitated, piloting its host, SCP-035 started charging towards the mask. Immediately, he spun around, becoming a tornado of hyperactivity and whooping noises as he sped down the adjacent corridor. The possessive mask staggered after him. The ooze leaking from the porcelain anomaly was dripping onto the mannequin wearing it causing the plastic to be melted away, exposing the flimsy metal skeleton beneath. It knew it had to merge with a new host, find something else to corrupt. SCP-035 chased after the cartoonish troublemaker, knowing that if it could catch him, he'd be able to survive merging with it. His body, while wearing the other mask, barely obeyed the laws of physics, making him invulnerable to damage and possibly even the corrosive substance oozing from the possessive mask. As if those weren't enough reasons, his powers seemed virtually limitless. Combined with the green-headed lunatic, SCP-035 could do anything. Reaching a stop at the end of another corridor, the mask spun around, wearing a comically undersized baseball uniform. He reached into his pocket and produced an oversized baseball bat, then proceeded to start hurling baseballs into the air and swatting them as hard as he could. As the mask increased the speed of his swings, a volley of hard cork baseballs were fired down the corridor like a barrage of bullets, ricocheting off the walls and hitting the oncoming SCP-035. Each one struck its target, reeling the mannequin, but doing little much else to stop it getting closer and closer, until, with an almighty swing, the mask brought his bat crashing into SCP-035 with enough force to send the possessive mask and its hosts careening down the corridor. It sailed through the air, bursting through a wall, then flew into a research lab, tearing a huge hole in the next wall as it kept going. Finally, it came crashing out of the last wall, the outer wall of the facility, and dropped multiple stories to the ground outside. Changing costumes back to his classic suit, 
and dashing after SCP-035, the mask passed through all the holes his adversary had left in the multiple walls it had crashed into. He screeched to a halt again and paused after getting through the outer wall, only to realize after a moment that he was hovering in mid-air, not standing on anything. Reaching into his suit pocket, the mask pulled out a sign on a stick with a single word written on it. Yikes. He plummeted down to ground level, landing with such an immense crash that his body cracked into the asphalt below. It left a perfect outline of him imprinted in the ground, causing the mask to go completely pancake flat head to toe. Suddenly, before he could peel himself up off the ground and go back to being three-dimensional, SCP-035 staggered to its host's feet and pinned the mask down. Finally, it growled. I've caught you. I've won. Your power is mine. Once I've combined with you, I will be able to ravage this world. I'm going to fuse to your face. Then I'll start with decimating those wretches that imprison me. The foundation will fall, and then so will the rest of their precious world. Forcefully, the mannequin's hand wrenched the mask off the ground. But as SCP-035 turned to look at what it had hoped to be its next host, well, let's just say the tragedy frown carved into its porcelain face had never been more appropriate. It wasn't holding the mask, it was holding a life-size cardboard cutout of a photo of the mask, grinning out from one side. Enraged, the possessive mask tore the decoy in half with its mannequin's hands. Hey, Pachuco! said a cartoonish voice from right behind it. Did you miss me? The mask had reappeared for real this time, grinning with his huge teeth, clearly getting a kick out of having someone to torment. SCP-035, on the other hand, had been getting increasingly irritated by all the wacky cartoon antics. With all the aggression it could channel through its mannequin host, it gripped the mask by the throat, his eyes bulging out of his head again. See, no need to get all choked up over it! He gagged. You are so tiresome! The possessive mask yelled, having finally run out of patience. You know what? I won't merge with you. I should just kill you and put an end to your buffoonery. Let me take this thing off you first, though. Its mannequin fingers started to hook into the mask's seam at the back of his bald green head. Wait, wait! The mask begged, putting up both his hands in surrender. At least give me a final request, huh? Master Mask! Before the possessive mask could respond, the mask had swept it off its dissolving mannequin feet. He started to spin it around in a wild, over-the-top dance number, bopping and swinging to a tune that seemed to be coming from nowhere. The longer it went on for, the more and more of SCP-035's host's body started to dissolve away, until the mannequin finally wasted away. All that was left was a bubbling pile of black goo on the ground with the possessive mask laying in the middle. The mask chuckled, noticing the fumes trailing upwards into the air as the corrosive substance melted away the last of SCP-035's host. Talk about smoking! He had it. He still couldn't believe that he had it. Very few professional thieves managed to steal something so valuable right from under the nose of the SCP Foundation, and even fewer lived to tell anyone about it. Kazdan gripped the bag in one hand, holding on to it so tightly, his knuckles felt like they might split. He was drenched in nervous sweat, the clamminess of his palms leaving an imprint on the material of the duffel bag. Its precious contents moved around loosely. Every time it jostled and knocked against him, Kasdan had to fight the urge to unzip the bag, just to remind himself this was all actually happening. But he resisted. He knew the mask wanted not only to be seen, but to be heard as well. The earpiece his client had provided was doing its job, keeping the whispers at bay, dampening the telepathic aura enough to ensure that Kasdan retained control over his own faculties. The bag, he'd been told, would also hopefully dampen the powers of the mask's corrosive fluid. He'd been prepped extensively for this job, more than any other in his long and storied criminal career. It had taken months of planning, staking out the home of a Foundation researcher, stealing his access card, and slipping into the heavily guarded facility undetected. As if that hadn't been hard enough, he then had to find the right containment cell containing what he'd been hired to steal. Just like any heist, the timing was everything. He had to make sure he was there on the exact day the glass container housing his target was due to be replaced, thanks to corrosion damage, having been gradually melted and worn away over time. At an intensely precise moment on precisely the right day, Kasdan had to enter the cell and sedate not only the research staff that had come to swap out the glass container, 
but the armed guards posted outside too. Then, it was just a case of slipping on the specialized gloves he'd been issued, grabbing the mask, and stashing it in the bag with protective lining to stop it from being corroded during transit. All things considered, Kasten had been doing pretty well, given the circumstances. That was until he heard the blare of alarms ringing out. His heart, which had already been drumming away in his chest through sheer nerves, now began beating so fast it threatened to crack his ribs. Panic shot through his entire system, and at that moment, all sense of rationality was dropped faster than a lead balloon. Any further attempts at subterfuge were pointless. Why keep hiding? Surely the alarms were for him, Kasten thought, and immediately started running, losing all cover. He barged past a pair of Foundation researchers in lab coats, knocking them both to the ground. A storm of paper files they'd been carrying were hurled up into the air, a temporary smoke screen to cover Kasdan's panicked escape. One foot launching past the other, he barreled down the facility's corridors the same way he'd come in. If he was quick, he might make it before they sealed the exits and trapped him inside. The chances were slim, and Kasdan knew it but he was left with no other choice apart from letting the SCP Foundation catch him, hauling him off to God knows where for interrogation. He barreled past more Foundation staff, some of them holding their hands out to try and stop him as they figured out what the alarms were for and why Kasdan was running. Shoving one out of the way, he felt something snag at the lab coat he'd worn as a disguise. One of the researchers had him. Kicking a leg back, Kasdan clipped the man's knee and whipped himself free of the coat not letting him stop from running. He was close now, so close to the door he'd come in through. If he could just pass this corner, he'd be home free. The clomp of multiple heavy steel-toed tactical boots came rushing through the entrance to meet him. A squad of men, one of the Foundation's infamous mobile task forces, were hurtling towards Kasdan like a tidal wave wearing all-black combat gear. He skidded as he tried to turn back the way he'd come stumbling over his feet as he was chased by the sound of angry shouts commanding him to freeze, drop the bag, and get on the ground. Kasten dared not look over his shoulder, catching hints of the oncoming MTF agents in his peripheral vision, compelling him to keep running. But with no idea where to go, and four heavily armed operatives clipping at his heels, there was little hope of escaping now. A powerful weighty force struck Kasten's back, knocking the air out of his lungs as it pushed him over and kept him pinned to the floor. He could barely move as the agent tackled him, gasping as he desperately tried to pull his breath back. The rest of the squad gathered around him, all yelling and warning him not to move. But there was another sound. No, another voice drowning out the soldiers. The earpiece, the one thing keeping his mind safe. It was gone. It must have fallen out when he hit the ground. And now, the mask could get in. The whispering was unintelligible, nonsense really. Kasdan couldn't clearly make out what it was saying. He only knew it had quickly become the only thing he could hear and how it made him feel. He had to put the mask on. It was such a strong compulsion. It felt like so much more than a want, a desire to wear it. It was a need. The bag was so close dropped to the floor where he had been tackled. If he could just reach it and tear the zipper open, he'd have the mask in his hands. Rolling over, Kasdan lashed out at the MTF operative, catching him by surprise as his fist connected with the man's balaclava-covered face. The agent was stunned, lifting some of his weight that had been pinning the thief down just enough for Kasdan to free his other hand. Another pair of agents tried to hold his flailing arms to the ground, only for him to reach up and pull one of them face first into the concrete floor with a bloody crunch. With every ounce of strength he could muster, Kasdan moved like a man possessed, hurling the agent on his other arm into the first who had tackled him. Slipping out from underneath the crumpled agents, he crawled on his stomach as far and as fast as he could. Kasdan desperately scrambled for the duffel bag. It was so close, a mere few inches away, his fingertips brushing up against it as he reached but he couldn't grab it as much as he felt that overwhelming need to. His feet were still buried under the weight of the MTF operators and their gear, stopping him from reaching any further, until one of the agents moved just enough to free Kasten's foot. Everything seemed to move in slow motion. The MTF soldiers were reaching out to pull Kasten off the floor. As his hands shot forward and tightly gripped the straps of his bag, he could feel hands wrapped in tactical gloves gripping at his shirt. In that same instant, 
He wrenched the bag towards him and pulled down the zipper. He had to get what was inside, even if it killed him. He barely noticed his earpiece getting crunched under the heavy combat boot of one of the agents. Instead, he was inhaling fumes from the interior of the bag, its specialized inner lining already melting thanks to the viscous black substance secreting from the mask. Kasdan didn't even register the pain in his hands when he reached inside, the secretion corroding his bare skin as he retrieved what he'd been hired to steal, what he so now desperately needed to put on his face. SCP-035 the possessive mask. Time felt like it had ground to a halt, freezing everyone. Kasdan stared for a split second at the white porcelain surface of the mask. It felt like it was glaring hatefully at him, thanks to its exaggerated tragedy grimace. It was almost as if it disapproved of Kasdan, as if he was somehow unworthy of it. But holding it in his hands, the compulsion to put on SCP-035 was now so unbearable. Oblivious to the Foundation agents around him who were trying in vain to restrain him again, Kasdan tipped his face into the mask, and everything went black. It was like being half asleep, his awareness of certain things stripped away. Things like the pain searing his face, a gradual, acidic burning that was eating away at his flesh, corroding his body. And yet Kasdan could still feel occasional sensations, tremors running up his arms as his fists made contact with something then pulled back and struck again, leaving behind something wet on his knuckles. But he couldn't see. All around him was shrouded in darkness. He knew his body was moving, maybe even walking, taking him somewhere, but he had no clue where, and no control anymore. It was like someone Something else had pushed his mind out of the driver's seat, and now had both its corruptive hands on the wheel. His mind was now lost in the blackness, shut down, gone. It was only when he came back around that Kasdan felt the sheer, unrelenting agony fully wash over him. The mask was off again, leaving him a scorched, screaming mess. He was laying on the floor of another containment cell. This one was different from the one he'd stolen SCP-035 from. It was less heavily guarded, minimal security. It might not even have been in the same facility. Kasdan had no idea how long he'd been wearing the mask for. All he knew, apart from the intense pain of the corrosive black sludge breaking his body down and the bloodstains on his hands and clothes, was that he wasn't alone. Someone else was there with him. Kasdan didn't know the strangest part of all of this. He should be dead. No, he was dead. Much like Dr. Bright's medallion, the possessive mask typically wipes the human mind like OxyClean. If he was back, it meant somebody brought him back. Somebody with truly great power. Craning his head up, he caught sight of the cell's only other occupant. Even squinting through his stinging eyes, Kasdan couldn't make out exactly where the other man was from, only that he was much older. He was looking down at Kasdan, writhing on the floor. There was something almost… sad, lingering in his eyes. There was a kind sympathy behind them, not just from looking at someone with such severe injuries, but an almost apologetic gaze, like he was sorry that the pain even existed in the first place. Glad to see you back, my son, the old man said. It's been a while since I've needed to pull someone back from that deep in the darkness. I was worried I'd be a little rusty. The old man gently reached a hand out towards him and took Kasdan's pain away. He didn't heal him, not fully, just hit pause on his wounds. But before he could thank the kind stranger, the mask started whispering again. Only this time, it was calling to the old man. No longer hurting, but still reeling from what SCP-035 had done to him, Kasdan tried to stop the man, calling with a rasping voice, begging him not to listen to the possessive mask's call. He didn't seem as spellbound as Kasdan had been. In fact, the old man almost just looked like he was going through the motions, pacing over to where SCP-035 lay on the cell floor, picking it up, and just like Kasdan had done, he lifted the porcelain mask over his wrinkled, wizened face. Helpless, unable to do anything other than watch on in horror, Kasdan couldn't help but notice the tragic frown carved onto the surface of SCP-035 had shifted. Now, it was a wide, gaping smile, a comedic grin, 
with nothing but ill intent behind it. While he had no idea who the old man was, some swirling, sickening feeling in the pit of Kasten's stomach told him nothing good could come from putting that twisted mask over another anomalous being. If he had only known that SCP-343 was colloquially nicknamed God by the Foundation's staff, and was widely believed to be the sole creator of the entire universe, then Kasdan would have used all his strength to pull the mask off of the old man's face and smash it to pieces. But it was already too late. The very second the possessive mask slipped over SCP-343's face, the ground shook violently, like the very Earth itself was afraid of what had just happened. Still watching from the cell floor, Kasdan looked at this combined creature. It stood still for a moment, slowly breathing through the mask, before it lifted its hands and appeared to examine them. The comedy smile on SCP-035 made it seem like the mask itself was looking with a warped sense of glee at its new host body. More of that same black goo was being secreted out from beneath the mask. Drops of it were rolling off the old man's shoulders. They landed on the cell floor, melting tiny, burning holes as the substance dripped down through the concrete and steel of the facility. His body being puppeteered by the mask on his face, the old man wiped a smear of the sludge away with his hand, looking at it in his fingers. It wasn't melting him the same way it had to cast him. Usually, the corrosive secretion that SCP-035 naturally produced proved to be its weakness, melting the bodies of its human hosts and eventually destroying them leaving the mask without a form to pilot. SCP-343, on the other hand, was only humanoid in shape, and far beyond any mortal being that the possessive mask had ever enthralled. The combined being, corruptive mask, and omnipotent god raised its hands high, like a conductor before an orchestra. From the spot he lay in, Kasdan watched in horror as every member of staff in the facility was pulled up through the floor or dragged screaming through the walls piping and brickwork tearing through them. This was a minimum security foundation wing, far more relaxed with only a handful of staff and a light force of guards. Still to SCP-035, it didn't matter how many there were, it was enough to make a start. The wrinkly hands of its new hosts clenched sharply. The foundation staff all suspended in mid-air suddenly exploded. Each one of them, every researcher and guard erupted into a fireball burning white-hot like heated metal before fizzling out. There was nothing left, no scraps of clothing, no remains. They just weren't. If it wanted to, SCP-035 would have thrown its head back and laughed maniacally. In some strange way, Kasdan thought that might have been better. Instead, it was silent, the mask's wide, soulless grin conveying its twisted delight well enough. It turned to face the wall, thick layers of concrete standing between it and the outside world, and began stepping forward, so completely casually that it was unnerving. With its first step, the walls of the cell surrounding the SCP-035 and SCP-343 hybrid, as well as Kasdan, began to crumble away. With the second, the corridor outside did the same, falling apart without any exertion of effort from the masked god. Each and every step further, more of the building around them was chipped away, carving a path through rooms and research stations towards the edge of the site. It was as though the concrete and brickwork, the dense, heavy materials that constructed the facility, suddenly had the consistency of wet sand, and SCP-035 and its new host were the tides coming in, washing away all in their path. No longer in pain, but his body distorted beyond repair, Kasdan forced himself up off the ground at last. Weakly, he limped after the creature, thinking in vain he had any chance to stand against a being with the unbridled power of a god and the infinite cruelty and malice of the possessive mask. If he could just get close enough, Kasdan thought, he could tear the mask away, freeing the old man. He wouldn't be able to stop himself from putting it on a second time, but perhaps it was better that Kasdan wore it and let its black ooze melt him down. At least the wise, kindly old man would be able to get far enough away from SCP-035's influence, and Kasdan could, at least in part, put this right. After all, he'd stolen the mask from the Foundation, and this all started with him. As the hybrid reached the farthest wall, the barrier turned to glass and shattered. The combined monster looked out over the waiting, helpless world. Through SCP-343, the possessive mask had control over chaos and creation alike, 
and nothing on earth that could challenge it. Not the foundation, not humanity, not even other anomalies. Lifting its still lifeless grinning mask upwards, the sky darkened, the deafening boom of thunder ringing out above. Forked bolts of deep orange lightning cracked across the atmosphere as what was left of the Foundation facility dissolved behind the masked god. Though it was facing out towards a world that would soon crumble as easily as this building, the creature could see everything, far beyond where it stood, the lives of billions upon billions. All at once, it watched plants grow while others wilted, animals born only to die, humans living out their ritualistic existences, each one of them gradually heading for the same fate. And through all of that, it saw a hand trembling behind it, reaching for its mask. Cast him. He was so close, fingertips just about to brush the porcelain surface of SCP-035, when suddenly the mask and the old man wearing it were gone. Kasdan turned around in confusion, only to find it was now standing behind him. It reached out one of the wrinkled, bony old hands and touched a single finger on his forehead. Kasdan blinked, and he was back back before the heist, before any of the wanton devastation had begun. He recognized the room he was in, and sat in the very same place where his mysterious benefactor had approached him with a seemingly impossible job, to steal a mask from the SCP Foundation. Sure enough, sitting across the table, obscured by shadow, was the client. But behind his eyes, Kasten was trapped, helpless as he watched himself live out the same events that had led to the mask being placed on the face of God. He couldn't change the course of history, couldn't avert the apocalypse that was already happening. All he could do was watch, his heart sinking as his client pushed a file across the table, opening it to reveal a photograph of his target, the thing he wanted cast in to steal. SCP-035, the possessive mask. And meanwhile, back in the new hell of its own creation, the mask was having some real fun. Shirley woke up screaming, louder than usual this time. Bay, Shirley's wife, bolted upright, as though someone had just run a 20,000 volt charge through her. Her dirty hand clasped over Shirley's mouth until the awful sound stopped. She whispered, Baby, it was just a dream, just a dream. Shirley fell into a terrified silence, trying to regulate her breathing. They'd been hiding in an abandoned apartment block for three days now, waiting for the roads to clear so they could take the chance and move forward. Bay, keeping closer to the ground, scuttled over to one of the smashed out windows. She stared down onto the street, 30 feet below. Midnight. No stars, cars crashed up against one another from the initial panic, and thank God, none of those things down there. She breathed a sigh of relief and returned to Shirley, gathering her up in her arms and giving her a reassuring squeeze. Her body was still trembling. What happened in this one? Bea asked. Shirley exhaled and closed her eyes. We were close now, she said. We're so close, Bay. It was the dream that began this journey. The quest for the last safe place. Initially, Bay had thought it was a fool's errand. There were no safe places in this world anymore. Nowhere that the sun or its terrible monsters hadn't touched. But Shirley insisted otherwise. She'd seen it in her dreams. A place of almost mythical wonder. A vast and complex facility away from the light. Site 19. Shirley and Bay grabbed their backpacks and shrugged them on. It was best to set off now, get a few hours of walking under their belts, and find some shelter before the sun came back up. In the meantime, all they needed to do was avoid the monsters lurking out there. It was an interesting trade-off. Once upon a time, years and years ago, when the sun changed, there had been billions of those things. They were people once until the new light touched them and turned them into these slimy abominations. There was a time you couldn't look out your window without seeing hundreds of them slithering past you. Then, they started coagulating, becoming these huge, mountainous masses of gloopy, melted flesh. It was nice that there were fewer now, made them easier to avoid, easier to sneak around, but if one of those things found you, you were dead. Or more likely, you were about to be something so much worse than dead. The two women trekked down the side of the road, keeping to the shadows even in the dark. They were on the edge of the city now, and it wouldn't be long until they were in the wilderness. Pro, 
Being away from a population center meant lower odds of being attacked by one of those monsters. Con, fewer places to hide when the sun came up. In the meantime, all they could do was keep walking and hope. It was an almost supernatural mixture of luck and skill that had gotten them this far. They'd known each other for four years when day broke, and everything went to hell. But they'd only been married for about a month. It'd been a hell of a post-honeymoon wake-up call. So many had been changed in the initial panic, and so many more had been destroyed by what came after. But these two weren't just anybody. In fact, it was the specific combination of skills and knowledge these two possessed that kept them alive for this long. In the world that came before, Bay had been a soldier who'd done two tours abroad and seen active combat multiple times, and Shirley had been a doctor, rising through the ranks of a local hospital. Between them, they could fight for and heal one another, despite everything. And in those early years, that's all it had been. They were always moving, always avoiding the terrors outside and the tyranny of the sun. They'd avoided the dangers that had destroyed so many others, but they'd never dared to hope. Hope was lofty, impractical, it got people killed. They'd only ever tried to survive. The immediate avoidance of death was a practical goal, anything else was just confetti. Until of course Shirley had started having the dreams. Some were just fragments, like sifting through a stack of photographs in the middle of a deep fog. Others were full narratives, like movies in her head, viewed in the first person, but all of them were about the same thing. She and Bay needed to make it to a place they called Site 19. Something about it was familiar, like a thing she'd heard years ago, perhaps from those strange broadcasts that were on every TV screen during the initial chaos. Oh, and of course, there was one more element in the dream. The one thing that made it seem more like a nightmare. In this part of the dream, she was already in Site 19 and walking down a long, dark hallway, somewhere far away from the sun. There are a series of heavy reinforced doors along the wall next to her. Each one of them had a number on them. Advancing as she got further down the hall, 029, 030, 031, 032. That's when she'd hear the voice. That awful, terrible voice. Shirley. Oh, Shirley. Come closer. Don't you want to see my face? I'm smiling, Shirley. I'd like for you to see it. She'd reached the door marked 035, at which point the door slowly creaked open. Even after all the terrifying things they'd seen in the new world, this somehow paralyzed her with fear every time. It was a kind of dread she'd never experienced before. Something that looked like black water would start seeping out from the opening door, then footsteps getting closer. A shambling figure would emerge from the open door. It was hard to make it out fully in the dark, but somehow she just intuitively knew what was coming towards her. It had a stark white face like a mask, with nothing but darkness where the eyes should be. Down below, the body, seemingly heavily injured and dripping with the same black water, was one she recognized. Her own. She couldn't move. The masked figure, this masked version of her, kept getting closer, dripping with more and more of that black water. It was shaking, almost vibrating. Then she realized it was laughing. <laughs> See you soon, Shirley, it said. Can't wait for you and Bay to visit. And that was when she woke up screaming. Somehow, despite the grim ending, some part of Shirley knew that she and Bay needed to get to Site 19. Only there would she be safe and perhaps even find the answers about how all this horror had even transpired. They were already risking their lives out here every day. Wouldn't it be worth it to find the truth? The duo continued to trudge through the night. It was, they thanked their lucky stars, a relatively uneventful journey. They encountered one of the flesh beasts on the edge of town, but they were able to hide inside a nearby bus depot until it slithered on, gibbering incoherent madness. After waiting to make sure it was gone, 
the duo left the city and ventured out into the Badlands. Shirley continued to insist that the legendary Psych-19 from her dreams was definitely close by now. Bay looked up to the sky and chimed in, I hope you're right, honey, or you and me are fried eggs. Shirley and Bay walked for another several hours, each becoming more slightly anxious that the sun would rise before they reached ample cover and everything they worked for would be taken away from them. The terror persisted until, against all odds, a huge black shape started to emerge along the horizon. The sight of it made Shirley's eyes widen in amazement. That's it, Bay, she said. Sight 19, just like it was in my dreams. They passed the chain link fence around the perimeter, approaching this large, seemingly abandoned building like it was the lost city of El Dorado. Bay was astonished. She loved Shirley, of course, and had faith in her beliefs, but something about a place prophesized in a dream actually being real was honestly nothing short of a miracle. The two of them approached the fortified front door and heaved it open together. Against all odds, they could see light inside the building. They still had power here. Nowhere had power anymore. Maybe this place really was salvation after all. As the two closed the door behind them, they noticed that the windows all around them were shuttered. It must have been some precautionary measure against the new sun. Smart. Whoever these people were, they'd thought ahead. They'd have some kind of preparation for all of this. So Bay couldn't help but wonder, where had they all gone now? As the two ventured deeper into the building, Bay unholstered a handgun that she'd been keeping in her jacket. It was no good against the flesh monsters, but it was a worthwhile deterrent against other desperate people out on the road. Lucky for them, she hadn't needed to fire it yet. Other than the power being on somehow, the place seemed abandoned. They traveled from room to room, offices, filing areas, what seemed like laboratories, libraries, rest areas. There was no real indication of what these people, whoever they were, actually did around here. After searching through a few different files, all written in almost incomprehensible shorthand and code, Shirley at least found a name to put to these people, the SCP Foundation. Was it some kind of charity? They ventured deeper, until they found a hall marked D-Class Bunks. Inside, they found bunk beds stacked on top of each other, enough to hold hundreds of people. Bay wondered aloud whether this was some kind of secret paramilitary outfit. It was the one thing that might explain everything they'd seen here today. And in all fairness, she was at least partially right. Okay, ladies, hold it right there. Shirley and Bay turned around to see a man in an orange jumpsuit standing a few feet behind them. He was carrying an assault rifle and training it on both of them. He was a tall, imposing man, and yet he was shaking. Bay lowered her gun. Neither she nor Shirley said a word. You're human, right? He said, voice trembling slightly. What? Shirley replied. Just answer the damn question. There was a tense pause, where nobody there seemed to know what might happen to them next. The stranger's finger started curling around the trigger. It was Bay who broke the silence. We look human, don't we? She said. Another moment passed. The gun rattled in the stranger's hands. He exhaled and lowered the barrel, taking a more relaxed stance. Sorry, he said. Can't be too careful. Kind of stuff they used to keep in here. It'd give you nightmares. Ah, uh, Mike, by the way. He approached, tentatively shaking Shirley and Bay's hands, just to prove to them that he wasn't the kind of guy who liked to gun down random women. He asked them whether they were hungry, and when they told them they hadn't eaten anything but protein bars in over a week, he told them he was about to show them something incredible, the Site 19 break room. Not long after that, Shirley, Bay, and Mike were all sitting around, enjoying some defrosted Hot Pockets. At that moment, no three-course meal cooked up by a five-star chef could ever even compare. As they ate together, Mike told his story. The people who used to run this place, believe me, they were nut jobs. Sure, back in the day, I wasn't such a nice guy. Me and some other knuckleheads, we needed the money, so we robbed a few places. People got caught in the crossfire. Next thing I know, I'm on death row. And then these men in white coats they came and told me I could get a commuted sentence if I came and took part in some experiments. That's how they got me into the house of whores right here. If Shirley and Bay hadn't lived through the apocalyptic hell of when day breaks, they might have not believed Mike. He told them about how this SCP Foundation used to use humans in experiments. 
subjecting them to all the monsters they had locked up down here. There was this giant reptile that couldn't be killed, some freaky statue that'd snap your neck if you stopped looking at it. But the one that frightened him the most, the one that haunted his dreams ever since he got here, the mask, Shirley said aloud, lost in thought. Mike was taken aback. How had she known what he was going to say? It did nothing to reduce his fear when she told him that she'd been dreaming about the mask for over a month now. Stark white, with black water dripping from it. Everyone was silent for a moment. Bay and Mike just stared at Shirley, equal parts amazed and frightened. Mike cleared his throat and told Shirley that in the years that had passed since day broke, the population of Site-19 had slowly dwindled. Monsters had escaped. The flesh beasts had slithered in and taken others. Over time, most of the staff had either died, changed, or left. All that was left here was him and the mask. Luckily for him, he'd never been directly cross-tested with it, because those who got tested with the mask never came back. Sometimes he could hear it whispering in his dreams, trying to leak itself into his mind, drip by drip, poisoning his soul. The one saving grace was that being a mask, it couldn't exactly walk up and tap you on the shoulder. All you needed to do was stay away from it, and you'd be fine. The mask couldn't hurt you on its own. The three of them carried on talking for the last hours of the morning. Night had become day, and day had become night. It was the easiest way to survive these days, or at least survive as yourself. Bay and Shirley told Mike how they'd met in college all those years ago. Mike told them the story of how he managed to survive by hiding in a broom closet, while some gangly white monstrosity chased down and slaughtered the rest of his bunkmates. The tiredness took them all again, and they decided to bed down in the D-class bunks. They were more comfortable than the bedrolls that Shirley and Bay had been sleeping on in abandoned buildings for the last year or so. To Mike, this place had been a living hell once upon a time. But now, for a brief period in this terrifying new world, it could be heaven. Shirley drifted off to uneasy sleep, trying her best to ignore the whispers. In what only felt like a few moments, her eyes fluttered back open. She was in a new place, but one that felt oddly familiar. A long, dark hallway bordered on one side by a series of iron doors. She turned her head slightly, eyes still adjusting to the darkness. The number on the door next to her read 027. Further down the hall, Shirley saw a dark figure, standing tall, shoulders broad and back erect as a ballet dancer. As her vision came back into focus, she saw a shock of orange. It was Mike, wearing that same orange jumpsuit. He was standing about 10 or 15 feet away, staring in the opposite direction. Mike, Shirley said operating on the foggy half-logic of a dream. He didn't respond. With growing concern, she started stepping closer. Mike? That's when she noticed something else. Black water pooled around Mike's feet. The sight of it stopped her in her tracks and froze the breath in her throat. With an almost audible creak, Mike turned around. A grinning white mask covered up his face. Hello, Shirley, it said. So lovely to finally meet face to face, eh? I bet you're so glad you ran into me. After all, sleepwalking can be dangerous. Shirley screamed and ran in the opposite direction, wasting no time at all. She heard the slow, measured footsteps of Mike wearing the mask behind her. It was in no rush. It walked like a masked killer in a horror movie. Why run? The voice said, I've got all day, and I know you can't leave while the sun's up, darling. You and your beloved are all mine. It's only a matter of time. Somehow, despite her being so far ahead, the voice sounded like it was right next to her ear. Like it wasn't speaking out of its mouth, it was just talking directly into her brain. With every syllable, her mind started to slow like the mask's voice was tar seeping in between the gears. Soon enough, her legs stopped working. Shirley was frozen in place, hearing the footsteps of the masked Mike behind her. Her brain was flooded with dark thoughts. Death, pain, torture, grief. The final smothering of all hopes and happiness. There was really nothing like it. Like every nightmare she'd ever experienced being collected into one terrible elixir and poured onto her mind. So this was what that horrible mask could do. Soon enough, the masked Mike had passed her and turned to look directly at her face. 
There was an awful smell, like chemicals and burning flesh. She turned her gaze downwards, seeing that it looked like Mike's body was somehow melting away from all that black water. It was like acid. Mike was a weak host, the mask said, as if it was replying to her thoughts. He won't last much longer, but that's fine. I'm looking forward to taking you for a whirl, dear Shirley. And when your hands are mine, you can only imagine the terrible things I'm going to do to your beloved bay with them. Shirley, with all her willpower, was able to move her mouth enough to force out the words, Don't you dare touch her. The monster laughed, just like it always did in her dream. <laughs> <laughs> That's not your choice to make anymore, it said. The mask reached for her with Mike's melting fingers, fizzling away with all that black slime, getting so close to caressing her tender cheek. All that awful silence was only broken by the sound of a soft clicking behind it, then a gunshot passing through the back of its stolen head. The mask turned, more shocked than anything, to see Bay standing there, wielding Mike's old assault rifle and aiming it with deadly accuracy. Before the mask could breathe another poisonous word, Bay opened fire, releasing a volley of bullets into the last of its melting body as it staggered back into the darkened hallway. Shirley watched in astonishment as the creature fell, Mike's body splattering into a puddle and sending the mask itself skidding down the hallway. Maybe it was just a trick of the mind, but she could swear the mask was frowning now not smiling. Bay breathed a sigh of relief and said, I'm thinking it's probably better if this place stays abandoned. Shirley, who hadn't quite regained her speech just yet, just smiled, nodded, and embraced Bay. They shared a kiss, just happy to still be together and alive, despite it all. Come nightfall, they left again, in search of another place. The possessive mask remained there, laying on the floor of some anonymous Site-19 hallway, just waiting for some unlucky, weak-minded survivor to wander in and try it on. The storms were unlike anything anyone had ever seen. But the worst part wasn't just the deadly gales, wind howling powerful enough to knock down buildings like rows of dominoes and lift the remaining debris of cities up into the air as if all that destruction weighed nothing. And it wasn't just the lightning, those arcs of crimson forking down from above. If one struck the ground near you, and one almost always did, the sheer force of it would knock you off your feet. The last thing you'd feel as you flailed helplessly in the air was the relentless pain of your body being disintegrated by the energy of the blood-red lightning, until there was nothing left of you for anyone to find. Yet somehow, that wasn't the worst part either. And it wasn't even the noise of it all either. That deafening cacophony of booming thunder and wild hurricane-force winds so loud Nobody could ignore it, all underscored by the screams of a world lost in suffering and madness. No, the worst part of it all was the sky. Whether anyone looked up, where there had once been that clear, calming blue, was now a swirling mass of nightmares. Many were surprised just how much they missed turning to that sky, that odd, universal comfort it brought. The knowledge that no matter how bleak things got, the sun would set on every bad day, and rise again to mark the start of another filled with potential. That promise of a future, no matter how uncertain, was replaced with a reminder of one thing, that this new, darker day had no end. There was no sunrise or sunset, no night or day. All that uncertainty and potential was replaced with certain doom, represented by a sky that looked like a river of blood. Deep reds and blacks swirled and thrashed above like the raging waves of the ocean, casting bolts of lightning down at the earth. Not to mention what else would occasionally drop from that blood-stained sky. Nobody had much information about how this all had started, how the world had become such an unrecognizable hellscape. Cynics would say that the world was already hell long before the sky turned red, although there wasn't much time for sarcastic jokes like that nowadays. As far as the few human beings that had survived could remember, the day everything changed had been little more than an ordinary day on planet Earth. One moment, things were normal. People were working tirelessly at their boring 9-to-5 jobs. Somewhere in the world, others had long since fallen asleep in a different time zone. Then all of a sudden, it appeared. 
Few survivors had actually seen it for themselves, and even fewer had lived to tell the tale. But rumors and whispers spread from camp to camp, dispossessed people huddling together in the ruins of houses or in abandoned subway tunnels that would hear the stories. And somehow, deep down in the fearful recesses of their hearts, they all knew, despite never having seen it, that it was real, the masked god. When it stepped upon the earth, it walked like any other person would. Its body even appeared to be human, an aged older man's body wrinkled and elderly, although not completely decrepit. Yet, it was his face, or what covered it, that really instilled that sense of fear and dread in anyone that heard the rumors. That being wore a mask, a porcelain comedy mask, the kind commonly associated with ancient Greek theater. It had a fixed, unnerving expression, a wide smile of twisted glee. It was almost as if it was getting some sick enjoyment out of all the chaos and destruction that had befallen the world, like it was pleased with its own handiwork. A thick black substance oozed from the mask too, adding to its unsettling appearance as streaks of what looked like tar trickled down the chalky white surface. It leaked out from underneath as well, dripping over the bony shoulders of the old man that wore it. Not one survivor that heard the stories of this monster understood what it was or where it had come from, but as if by some defiant influence, they all knew it was responsible for creating the hell they now lived in. That knowledge kept them hidden, kept them afraid, and kept them from fighting back. As had always been the case even before this apocalypse had been unleashed on the world, the only people who knew the truth were the ones who had been working for the SCP Foundation. They had more than their fair share of answers about what had happened and who or what this mask-wearing menace was, but naturally kept that information secret from the wider world. Not that there was much point in keeping secrets anymore, after all, there was hardly much of a world left for the Foundation to hide things from, and even fewer former personnel who had lasted this long. Even then, there was only a handful at the SCP Foundation who knew everything that had led to the current catastrophe. Most of the researchers and guards that had been going about their ordinary duties, running tests on contained anomalies or patrolling the site where a certain possessive mask was housed. The next thing everyone there knew was the blaring noise of alarms. Mobile task force troopers racing down the hallways. Their commander might have yelled something about a break-in, someone having gained access to the supposedly secure Foundation facility and stealing one of their anomalous objects. But not everybody, even those working in the same building, would have overheard that. They definitely didn't miss what happened next, though. As further alarms sounded, alerting the staff on site of a containment breach, the facility itself was torn apart in a flurry of chaos. Personnel, researchers, security, MTF soldiers were being incinerated, burned, until there was literally no trace of them left. Something stepped through the very brickwork of the building itself, smashing a hole through every room it passed until it burst out of the side. Then all of a sudden, the alarms weren't the loudest sound. Something else started deafening the Foundation staff who were still standing. The world outside had become even more chaotic. The sky had turned red. And all around, people were being killed, structures decimated, cities blown away in moments. Naturally, this wasn't the first time the Foundation had stared right into the face of an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Given the widespread presence and surveillance they had around the planet, it didn't take them long to learn of the horrors that were unfolding. The key word there was that they had a widespread presence, as in past tense. They thought they had enough resources to retaliate, too. Word quickly spread throughout the various arms of the SCP Foundation, informing the wider organization of the situation and urging them to work as one to enact a plan to stop what was happening. All they knew for certain was that SCP-035 had been removed from containment. Also known as the Possessive Mask, the object was known to have its own sentience and an innate ability to telepathically influence unwitting victims into wearing it. However, the mask also secreted a corrosive black substance, which normally dissolved the body of anyone who put it on. By itself, SCP-035 was nowhere near powerful enough to unleash a global catastrophe, though. Unfortunately, it had managed to influence someone who was that powerful into putting it on. Another anomaly. While to the untrained eye, SCP-343 could easily be mistaken for an elderly human man, 
Those at the Foundation knew that the fact he was now wearing the possessive mask was some of the worst news they could have ever received. Although none of the researchers working for the SCP Foundation, in fact, not even the O5 Council, knew if this was true, the colloquial nickname for SCP-343 was God. He not only claimed to be the sole creator of the entire universe, but had also exhibited extensive reality-warping abilities, advanced even for an anomalous being. His powers seemingly had no known limit in how they could be used to alter the world around him, although the old man himself seemed to be a passive, kindly soul, rarely causing active harm to other beings under normal circumstances. Of course, normal circumstances didn't include having the corruptive SCP-035 on his face, effectively putting the mask in the driver's seat and allowing it to use SCP-343's powers to lay waste to anything before it. The Foundation quickly diverted their considerable assets to a brute force retaliation in the hopes that a full-scale assault on the combined creature would somehow force a separation of the possessive mask from SCP-343's face. The tricky thing about this situation was, God's powers and the fact that he was an immortal, ageless being of potentially incomprehensible form all meant he couldn't be harmed. Causing external damage to him was extremely difficult. That was good news in some regard, after all. The Foundation didn't want to kill 343 if they could help it. They knew he wasn't acting on his own accord. But his indestructibility also meant that the corrosive goo that was secreted from SCP-035 had little to no effect on its new, impervious host. That meant it could keep going, keep unleashing hell, and stopping it was going to take a lot of manpower. Fortunately, the SCP Foundation never had any shortage of people to throw at a problem, and their ethos didn't really place much value on human life. They mobilized every mobile task force at their disposal, every one of them filled with ranks of highly trained elite operatives. Among the Foundation's forces were even MTF agents who had themselves been altered through anomalous means, their bodies augmented with technology and cybernetics, or their strength specially enhanced. Deploying the full might of their amassed forces, the SCP Foundation took the fight to SCP-035, with the goal of stopping its reign of terror and freeing SCP-343 if possible. The hybridized mask-wearing reality warper had already caused considerable damage since it had started its rampage. Although its motivations were far from political, the wearer of the anguish mask had begun with a devastating show of power, wiping numerous cities off the map. While the rest of the world scrambled to find some way of responding, the masked god teleported itself across the globe, destroying central governments and further crippling their own opportunities to initiate an armed response. In short, this meant the Foundation's move was to be humanity's last stand, their final chance to stop SCP-035 from its current course of harnessing the wise old man's power to turn the world into its own personal, nightmarish playground. To say there was a lot riding on the MTF assault would be an understatement, as would saying it went badly. When met with times of defeat, the old, rather morbid adage of fallen soldiers being sent home in bags is often applied. But if the masked hybrid had sent the Foundation its MTF troops back to them encased in body bags, then that would have been far kinder than what it actually did. The collected mobile task forces, the Foundation's own private army, were mobilized to Washington. Under the influence of the possessive mask, SCP-343 had wiped out not only the main seat of power in the United States, but the Pentagon as well, disabling the country's defenses. Suddenly, a mass of aerial transports and ground vehicles came hurtling towards the crater it had left behind. As it turned to look, the wide grin of satisfaction on SCP-035 became a long frown. Thanks to its new host's omniscience, it instantly recognized the foot soldiers of the organization that had kept it caged for so long. As the amassed MTFs marched towards it, the masked gods stepped out to meet the oncoming army, one being against thousands of troops, if not tens of thousands. If the mask had affixed itself to the face of any other anomaly, those soldiers might have stood a slim chance. The combined creature casually raised the bony arms of its host's body, the Foundation forces breaking into a charge the very second they saw it move. Like a tidal wave, they rushed towards their target, only for each individual operative to quickly realize that they had stopped moving. They were still running, legs still in motion, but their feet had been lifted off the ground. Plucked from the very earth they each had stood on, 
the MTFs were stuck in mid-air, defying the forces of gravity and unable to free themselves. Collectively, the Foundation's army looked to SCP-035, its tragic porcelain frown having switched back to the wide grin, punctuating the sick satisfaction it was about to take from what came next. It gave a click of God's lean fingers, and each of the MTF troops it had suspended in midair were shredded at the molecular level. Their bodies erupted with a spray of deep red viscera, each and every one of them being pulled to pieces from the inside out. Flesh, bone, and blood melting away, breaking down, becoming ash, and then atoms, and then nothing. It took around a minute. Not that it was terribly exerting for SCP-343's powers, but just because of how many troops the Foundation had sent to try and stop it. A mighty show of force, and all for nothing. With their mobile task forces decimated like a row of helpless tin soldiers, the SCP Foundation had lost its primary method of fighting back. But they were far from safe from the masked god's reach. Thanks to its hosts, SCP-035 wasn't all-knowing, but all-seeing, and able to be anywhere and everywhere in the blink of an eye. It began hunting the surviving pockets of the Foundation personnel. Out of nowhere, it would teleport into wherever they were hiding and turn their bodies inside out, or rearranging the functions of every orifice on their faces, only to vanish like a ghost, leaving no trace and no survivors. The braver ones tried desperately to come up with some new plan, a revised way to stop a creature that could be anywhere and do anything. On the other hand, the Foundation leadership the more highly ranked members like the Overwatch Council went to the ground. Plenty of them had contingency plans in place for Armageddon, and they were prepared to wait out the apocalypse in their own secluded safe haven. But with the Foundation all but gone, that's when the monsters got loose. No longer having anyone to guard them, to maintain their specific specialized containment procedures, the SCPs still held at Foundation sites were unleashed on the world. Untold horrors came spilling out of the ruined facilities, each one now acting as its own Pandora's box, bursting its lock and having its terrible contents lay waste to the planet already awash with chaos. A lot of the anomalies thrived in the world that SCP-035 had created, once they were finished fighting amongst themselves in the struggle of escaping their containment. Soon there were packs of SCP-745 running wild on the ruined highways, using their bioluminescent lights to hunt human survivors who were attempting to make the dangerous trek across open country. Meanwhile, a plague began spreading amongst other camps of these post-apocalyptic humans, a strange disease that seemed to cause people to rapidly grow extra teeth, overproducing them until SCP-4910, the Grinner, could catch up to them. Then there were the SCPs that fled the nightmare that the masked god had made of the world. Any that could travel between dimensions or remove themselves from this layer of reality quickly absconded to avoid the chaos. Some just went about their business, as if nothing had really changed. The Plague Doctor mostly kept to himself, traveling from place to place on foot, only stopping when he encountered people afflicted with the pestilence, before moving on in search of others. Some of the anomalies tried to help people. Rumors spread among some survivor camps of a half-man, half-cactus leaving them food and supplies in the night, with a note that read, From your friendly neighborhood cactus man. There weren't many who dared to oppose the creator of this dark new world, but some anomalies sought to challenge the rule of this combined creature. Perhaps, they thought, SCP-035 and SCP-343 couldn't possibly be all-powerful as the story said, that it would be easy to kill the king and assume control over his kingdom of chaos. There were plenty of other anomalies that had floated the idea. Not just the other reality warpers, but those that had figured out that if they separated the mask from its host, then this world would become their hellish paradise to rule over, so long as SCP-343 didn't instantly undo all the damage. But there was one that didn't want control. It didn't even necessarily mind the whole world had been turned into a walking nightmare. It just wanted to stand against the hybrid of malicious mask and all-powerful deity out of spite, based on nothing but pure hatred for any and all other forms of life other than itself. And it was that confrontation that would serve as a warning to the rest of the SCPs now freely roaming the world. SCP-682 slithered out into the open, claws coated with a fresh coating of blood from its latest slaughter, wetting the countless layers beneath that had already dried. 
The hard to destroy reptile had tracked the scent of the possessive mask's oozing black secretions, bringing the beast maw to porcelain face, with the combined being responsible for distorting the very fabric of the world. Already knowing the foul lizard was near thanks to its host's foresight, SCP-035's visage had already been locked in that unhappy grimace, dreading the approach of the day it would have to face the tenacious, irritating, regenerative reptile. It turned its host's body to face the huge beast, the trails of black streaked down its frowning face looking like angry tears staining its carved off-white skin. The two exchanged no words. SCP-682 had no doubt this pairing of corruptive mask and passive god already knew why it had come looking for it, and it was right. The possessive mask had long been looking into the mind of SCP-343 to prepare. It knew it wasn't one of the old man's children. In fact, God had completely denied ever being responsible for the creation of the unkillable monster. There was almost no strategy, even with the infinite power of its host's reality warping abilities, that SCP-035 could definitively kill SCP-682. Building up to a charge, the reptile swiped at the masked god, its talons narrowly nicking the porcelain surface of the mask the very second it teleported out of the way. Reappearing behind the monster, SCP-035 compelled its host body to lift its elderly arm and decimate the beast the same way it had to the Foundation's forces. With a fearsome hiss, the reptile's body was pulled apart. It growled with anger, annoyed and enraged more than deterred. Its strong, scaly limbs quickly regenerated, bone and muscle regrowing to replace what the mask god had torn away. SCP-682 gave a swipe of its tail, knocking the masked god a few feet away, reeling him. The anomalous hybrid teleported yet again, this time to inside the monstrous reptile. Shrinking down to almost infinitely small, the mask and god wrenched apart SCP-682's atoms, ripping up strand after strand of its very DNA, physically trying to unmake it on a cellular level. On the outside, the creature's body disintegrated as it roared, feeling its very genetic material breaking down only for it to rapidly reform just as SCP-343, wearing SCP-035, reappeared in front of it. There was no way for the masked god to kill the monster, despite how much it tried. Sending it hurtling into the fire of the sun, punching it into other dimensions, moving it down the recursive stack of reality to make its existence little more than fiction, eventually the possessive mask had to reconsider the problem at hand. Even with infinite power, the unkillable still remained unkillable. Rather than ask whether that meant its own power was truly unlimited, it instead resolved to the only option it had left. With a snap of its host's fingers, the combined creature sent the hard-to-kill reptile away. Far away. Universes upon multiverses of distances were put between the masked god and SCP-682, turning back towards the destruction it had wrought on this world. SCP-035 knew that the regenerating reptile would be back. But for now, it had more chaos to unfurl. Have we tried starving it of oxygen? Verheden asked, sounding bored with the conversation already. Yes, we have. Dr. Kelly grumbled in reply. We're able to create a vacuum, remove 99% of the air from its containment chamber, and its life signs dropped. Uh, I'm sensing there's a but coming next. The research assistant sighed, rolling his eyes. Uh, typical. But 682 was able to fill the chamber with a gas mixture of ozone, chlorine, xenon, and... Ugh, I forget. The Foundation doctor answered, getting more and more agitated. Point is, it was able to form and expel chemicals even without any active life signs. Ah, it's almost like there's a reason we call it the hard to destroy reptile. I just wish I could figure out what it was. Rahidan retorted, making no attempt to mask his sarcasm, giving a dry chuckle, much to Dr. Kelly's annoyance. It was a debate that had been going on for what felt like the entire history of the SCP Foundation. How could anyone possibly kill SCP-682? The creature had long been one of the most infamous anomalies that the Foundation had ever encountered, so much so that the Heart of Destroy Reptile was synonymous with the organization, but the mandate still stood that it needed to be destroyed, as soon as someone was able to figure out a way. Although they hadn't quite exhausted every possible option just yet, most of the researchers were running short on ideas. Thinking up a plan to kill 682 was made all the harder, knowing the creature had survived and regenerated from every single previous test. 
If there were something, some neutralization method that was going to work, surely they would have found it by now. Uh, maybe we should just leave it, researcher assistant Verheden suggested. I mean, we've got it sitting in a tank of acid, perpetually melting it as fast as it can reconstitute its body. While it's like that, 682 is hardly a threat to anyone. Hardly a threat? Dr. Kelly scoffed, clearly more than perturbed. You're dead wrong, Verheden. As long as that monstrosity continues to live, it poses a constant threat to every single human being on this planet. Hell, every life form in the world, it hates everything else that much. Look, I'm just saying that after Reese and Fossa were discussing this issue and maybe the whole... His voice trailed off for a moment. After the situation that led to, maybe it's better if we leave 682 alone. It seems that every time we try to come up with a solution to our reptile problem, something always goes wrong. The whole thing's cursed, Doc. Like a big joke where the punchline is more and more of us end up dead while 682 keeps on living just despite us. You have no idea what you're talking about, Kelly yelled, infuriated by such a suggestion that trying to destroy 682 once and for all was little more than an exercise in futility. Hey, hey, take it easy. His subordinate replied, trying to calm Kelly down. You gotta admit, Doc, it seems more impossible than, well, all the other impossible things that we see in this job. It's an important mission of the SCP Foundation, Verheden, Dr. growled, holding back his rage. To safeguard humanity from anomalous threats, I'm convinced we just need to find the right set of variables, the right conditions or equipment, and I... We can kill this thing once and for all. But where do we go from here? I mean, we've tried conventional weapons, other anomalies. If other powerful SCPs can't kill this thing, what chance do we have? Maybe it's a case of finding the right one, Dr. Kelly theorized. SCP-738 and SCP-743 both failed. We couldn't even fit 682 in the booths of the clockworks if we wanted to. So back to the drawing board. What haven't we tried? <laughs> Why don't we just throw SCP-035 on it? Verheden remarked, clearly making another snide, sarcastic joke. That thing wouldn't even fit over 682's big lizard snout. It would probably just slide off onto the floor. Hold on, Kelly replied, pondering the idea for a moment. Since being assigned to the site containing SCP-682, studying the reptile up close, he had become determined to figure out some way to finally kill it. It would make him a legend in the history of the Foundation being the one who did what they had failed to do for so many years. That might just work. Doc, I was kidding. Uh, Doc? His research assistant replied, turning to see that Dr. Kelly was already racing down the corridors of the facility. That is an absurd suggestion. Dr. Bright answered when Kelly came rushing up to him, hastily explaining his plan for SCP-682's termination. No, listen here, Jack. Please, just hear me out, Kelly urged. Yes, SCP-035 is a dangerous anomaly in its own right, but it's also deadly to the wearer. It secretes that substance that corrodes the body or of whoever or whatever wears it, right? And you came up with the idea to place such an object over the head of a creature that can regenerate and adapt to almost any form of damage, Bright retorted before the other Foundation doctor could finish. That's precisely my proposal, he replied. Look, we already keep SCP-682 contained in a vat of acid for safety, right? melt away its body before it has a chance to fully regenerate, keeping it in this perpetual state of healing and sustaining damage at the same speed. Now what if we go the whole hog? Let SCP-035 take control of the reptile until the mask drenches it in black goo, melting it down for good. And you've considered the other possibilities, right? Bright asked, trying his best to walk away from Kelly as they spoke. That SCP-035 takes full control of 682 and is granted an immortal host that might not degrade under its secretion there's a far higher likelihood that SCP-035 wouldn't even fit on the reptile. Its face is the wrong shape. The possessive mask is made for humanoid faces, not reptilian ones. Yeah, but the reptile is able to adapt, is it not? Kelly fired back. Correct. And if we allow it to adapt to SCP-035, we could even have a greater monstrosity on our hands, a hybrid of the possessive mask and the hard to destroy reptile. Oh my God. Jack Bright shouted, fed up with having to listen to Kelly's outlandish idea. A being like that would be hell-bent on destruction. I'm sorry, Dr. Kelly. The, the answer is no. Please, the other doctor begged. Just send it up the chain on my behalf. I just need clearance to run one test. 
I can take it higher, but I'm telling you now the answer won't change, Dr. Bright admitted, agreeing just to get Kelly to back off. Sure enough, later that very same day, Dr. Kelly received a notice from the senior research staff, his superiors within the foundation. Dr. Kelly, we have learned of your proposed experiment for terminating SCP-682. Unfortunately, after conferring, we have decided this course of action would pose too great a risk to the safety of civilians, as well as our own staff here at the SCP Foundation. Additionally, Dr. Bright has raised concerns with us about your recent obsessive behavior. We would kindly ask you to attend a mandatory psychiatric evaluation tomorrow at 1500 hours to assess and potentially reassign you. Given your interest in using SCP-035, we feel, in your current state, you may be at risk of being influenced by the psionic effects of the possessive mask. The message from the research supervisors was still open on Kelly's computer terminal when Verheden went to check on him. It looked like the doctor had started typing a response. You idiots want to psych eval me? You want to ignore the actual present threat to the Foundation? The longer we keep that reptile alive, the more everyone and everything is at risk. But you want to persecute me for trying to come up with a radical solution? If you're all too cowardly to act, then I have no choice but to- Kelly had left the rest unfinished without hitting send. Although it didn't take much of a reach for his research assistant to realize that his sentence would have ended with, do it myself. His heart pounding, regretted ever suggesting using the possessive mask as a joke, Verheden got up and ran, racing through the corridors as fast as he could towards the containment cell for SCP-035. He had a sick feeling in his stomach that he might find Dr. Kelly already there, acting out of a fit of uncontrollable anger and what he thought was a moral obligation to destroy SCP-682. Dr. Kelly had stolen some amnestics from the Foundation's storerooms. Lacing two cups of coffee with the memory-altering drugs, he'd offered the hot beverage to the pair of armed guards stationed outside the room where SCP-035 was held. Accepting what they thought to be an act of kindness from a Foundation doctor, both security officers had quickly forgotten why they were standing around so idly. Luckily, the friendly Foundation doctor had reminded them they had reached the end of their shift and were free to go and punch the clock. With no reason to question him, the guards wandered away, leaving Dr. Kelly alone with SCP-035. Then the whispers started. They seemed garbled, unintelligible at first. But the closer that Dr. Kelly grew to the glass case, the clearer the voice of the possessive mask started to sound. So, it hissed, I hear you have a reptile problem, Doctor. The loud wailing of alarms told Verheden he was already too late. SCP-035 had breached containment, thanks to a rogue Dr. Kelly, no doubt. The research assistant cursed his own big mouth for even mentioning SCP-035 as an option for destroying the reptile, although he could have never known Kelly would take it so seriously as a suggestion. But now the doctor's obsession with being responsible for finally ending SCP-682 was running rampant. Turning a corner, the research assistant stopped in his tracks. He had quickly realized it was pointless heading towards the SCP-035 containment chamber. Dr. Kelly would already have what he needed from there. But there was only one place he'd be heading once he had the possessive mask in tow. Taking the corresponding corridor, Verheden raced through the Foundation facility toward the direction of the room housing the vat of acid where the hard-to-destroy reptile was waiting. A trail of bodies scalded and scorched with a viscous black substance told him he was on the right track. It was the same corrosive secretion that leaked from the possessive mask, meaning that either Kelly had forced someone to wear it, or worse, had been manipulated into putting it on himself. If SCP-035 had convinced him it might have the answer to killing the reptile, then little could have stopped Dr. Kelly from bringing it to SCP-682, whom the mask could use as its next host. And to researcher Verheden's horror, it looked like exactly that was about to happen as he arrived at SCP-682's containment cell. Doc, stop! He yelled in desperation. This has gone too far, please! Dr. Kelly turned to look over at his assistant, his face now obscured by the carved, exaggerated porcelain grin of the possessive mask. Its smile was one of twisted glee, like it was taunting Verheden for even trying to stop it. The corrosive liquid was leaking out from underneath it, spilling down Dr. Kelly's bare neck and onto his shoulders, rapidly melting away everything it touched. Meanwhile, the acid from SCP-682's tank was starting to be drained away, and the monster was beginning to stir. Hooking two fingers under the edge of the porcelain comedy mask, Kelly started to wrench it off his face, compelled by SCP-035. The mask knew of the Foundation Doctor's plan, and was far less interested in helping kill 682 
as it was using the reptile as an immortal host, finally one that wouldn't degrade in the same way so many others had before. With the last of his strength, he pulled the mask away, his brain-dead body succumbing to its injuries and dropping the mask right into SCP-682's tank. As SCP-035 landed on the creature's head, it let out a wild, pained roar. Black streaks of corrosive secretion began to trail down the reptile, making it thrash at the pain of the substance burning and dissolving the outer layers of its thick hide. The noises let out by 682 were enough to pull Verheden's eyes away from Dr. Kelly, whose body had collapsed lifelessly. He had died trying to bring an end to a monster the Foundation had never successfully destroyed, yet another life lost in the pursuit of killing the unkillable reptile. As the life-hating lizard thrashed about, looking like it was about to burst free of its cage in rage, the research assistant shot across the room to reverse the acid draining from the tank. The Foundation security team arrived in the containment room just as the acid tank had very nearly been fully refilled. Although he had no idea if it would have an effect, Verheden had stopped it just short of also submerging the possessive mask in the acid too, which still seemed to be precariously balanced on the 682's head, not covering its face. As a cleaning crew arrived to remove Kelly and the bodies he'd left in his wake, the Foundation had to come up with a plan for removing SCP-035 without their staff falling into the acid vat. No, 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 hold on, Verheden insisted. I know this started as a joke between the Doc and me, and I had no idea he had taken it so seriously, but look! He pointed to the inside of the tank. The gigantic reptilian monster was completely still, while the possessive mask still let streaks of its corrosive substance drip over its head, and it looked to be taking effect, still dissolving every part of the reptile it came into contact with. Maybe it could work? The research assistant mused. Retreat to a safe zone, the security chief instructed. We are to await orders on further course of action. If you want to observe, you'll have to do it from a distance. Falling back, it seemed the entire Foundation was waiting with bated breath to see what would happen next. Through back and forth radio chatter with their superiors, neither Verheden nor the security forces seemed to know how to proceed. From the outside, it looked like SCP-682 and SCP-035 were at a stalemate. But in the back of their minds, everyone had to wonder, how long was this going to last? What nobody noticed, however, was the unique way in which SCP-682 had adapted to coming into contact with SCP-035. A lump had formed on the topmost part of the reptile's head. Its scales had parted, allowing for the fleshy growth to swell until it was roughly the size and shape of the average human face. It lacked any of the usual characteristics, no eyes, nose, or mouth but seemed to work as a way to better mount the possessive mask, since it couldn't fit over the hard-to-destroy reptile's long, lizard-like features. Additionally, what looked like the black corrosive substance from SCP-035 leaking onto 682 and melting away at the mask's new host actually seemed to be another adjustment the creature had made to its own physiology. Instead of dissolving the reptile, the substance was being absorbed, diverted to a specially formed gland inside the monster, that was now safely storing the corrosive goo within its own mouth. But further within, beneath all the external and even internal changes occurring to SCP-682's body, a far greater change was taking place. Deep in the recesses of the twisted, murderous mind of SCP-682 was an intruder, a presence that the reptile could feel trying to bore its way in, to not only make itself known, but to take over. The pair of them, the consciousnesses of both these anomalies were battling each other for supremacy, the hard-to-destroy reptile wanting to retain control of its own body and mind, and the possessive mask desiring total dominion over its newfound host. SCP-682 had long been known to have a high level of psionic resistance, halting the spread of SCP-035's telepathic influence. However, because the reptile's body had adapted and acclimatized to the mask's corrosive secretion, it meant 035 was able to persist, hanging on and still trying to force its way into the reptile's mind. You hate them all so much, the voice of SCP-035 echoed from inside the hard-to-destroy reptile's head. Don't bother, it thought back in reply. You are alive. That makes you as disgusting and putrid to me as the rest of them. But think what we could achieve together, the mask whispered. For a moment, the reptile considered an alliance. Both it and the mask possessed a shared hatred towards humanity, although 682's extended to all other forms of life, including the sentient comedy mask it now wore. 
though even a temporary cooperation between the two might have its benefits. SCP-682 had no intention of remaining bound with the possessive mask for longer than it needed, and in much the same vein, SCP-035 was only proposing such a partnership to avoid being removed from perhaps one of the few beings that could wear it for an extended period of time without being dissolved entirely. Outside in the containment chamber, the Foundation personnel had been instructed to remove SCP-035 from the reptile, despite concerns that the sudden removal of the mask would cause the monster to enter a rage state. The possessive mask was now fused with the flesh of SCP-682 through its specialized protrusion, and the Foundation's fear was that the longer the pair of anomalies stayed bonded, the more the hard-to-destroy reptile would be able to adapt against other powerful SCPs. So, research assistant Verheden had been ordered to increase the acid contents of the tank to full capacity, hopefully burning the tissue connecting the reptile and the mask to each other. Before the white porcelain of SCP-035 could slip under the rising acid, a clawed arm reached up over the boiling vat and pulled the research assistant under. Screaming, he landed in the tank with a splash, followed by a rapid hiss. Clambering up out of its containment tank, the hybrid of SCP-682 and SCP-035 roared as the combined creature freed itself from containment. In the chamber below, all hell broke loose. Security officers reached for their weapons, not even waiting for the order before they opened fire. Bullets pinged off the porcelain comedy mask that was embedded in the top of the reptile's head, barely scratching the surface and unable to pierce the monster's scales. Some guards charged in, only for the reptile to spew a molten black substance from the specialized glands in its mouth. It was channeling the corrosive secretions from SCP-035 into a weapon, the resulting ooze dissolving the security team as they approached, stopping their futile attempt to recontain it before they could even try. Witnessing this, knowing their own imminent deaths were near, researchers and remaining Foundation security turned heel and ran for their lives as containment breach alarms blared through the facility. Although both anomalies were secretly intending to betray one another, for now SCP-682 and SCP-035 were free to unleash their combined monstrous form on the humans they both hated the most, their captors, the SCP Foundation. Having your ordinary life unceremoniously change forever without a moment's notice is something that people can often find themselves hoping for. Anything to break life's monotony and change circumstances to make them more interesting. Although, when that change comes in the form of being trapped in an endless IKEA outlet, it's not exactly the different kind of circumstances that people usually hope for. That was the situation that had befallen Winston not too long ago. What started as a simplistic, straightforward shopping trip with the goal of purchasing some affordable, stylish Swedish furniture had resulted in him having to adopt a completely different lifestyle. You see, Winston was one of the untold number of people to have an encounter with SCP-3008, better known colloquially as the Infinite IKEA. Appearing as an ordinary store, those entering the doors of SCP-3008 find themselves in an unending labyrinth of aisles upon aisles filled with flat pack homeware. It can be quite the system shock, of course, especially when people that find themselves inside the infinite IKEA learn there's no way to escape, even by retracing their steps back the way they came. Doing so, they'll only be met with a disheartening realization that the entrance isn't where it was upon their arrival. Now at first, learning that you've lost your entire life and are doomed to spend the rest of your days inside a limitless IKEA is admittedly a lot to take in. Your friends, family, job, all your worldly possessions are now unreachable, and everyone back home might likely spend many years wondering what happened to you. But it's not all bad news. As previously mentioned, Winston wasn't the only one to find himself in this predicament. Over the years, countless people have found their way inside the infinite IKEA. Given how expansive the interior of the never-ending store was, there has never been a way to know for certain exactly how many people have come to reside within SCP-3008, but it's enough to populate the number of small settlements that these survivors have been able to establish inside. By innovatively repurposing the materials around them, these individuals have found themselves to be the new denizens of SCP-3008. Imagine whole towns constructed from chairs and tables that have been used as building materials to provide a place of sanctuary to those that need it when they first arrive in the infinite IKEA. Sure, it takes a pretty big adjustment to this new lifestyle, 
But luckily, SCP-3008 provides for its inhabitants by automatically replenishing the food within its canteen. Naturally, it only offers items that are on the IKEA menu, but that's at least a consistent source of food and nutrition for those dwelling in its aisles. With food already taken care of, people inside SCP-3008 didn't even need to work. That was the strangest part that Winston found himself having to adapt to when he first got to the settlement of Cookware, named after the nearby sign that hung from the ceiling nearby, denoting one of the many departments of the store. It was odd to him how friendly everyone was, how much the people trapped inside 3008 cut off from the outside world forever seemed happy. There were many who'd been there for the longest that even claimed it was a better sense of life than out there in the real world. Inside the IKEA, there was a strong sense of community. Settlements helped each other out with construction, and because everything was provided for, no one had any need for selfishness or greed. After all, there was plenty of food to go around and money had no relevance. Ironic given they were all living inside a huge furniture store. Witnessing all of that helped Winston adapt to his new life inside SCP-3008 and made him feel a lot better about being in this predicament. The only real thing anyone inside the infinite IKEA had to worry about was the threat of the staff. These were the tall, faceless humanoids with elongated arms and legs that roamed the aisles of the furniture store while wearing distinctive IKEA uniforms. Most of the time, they remained docile, paying the human survivors little attention. That is, until the fluorescent lights above dimmed, signaling the beginning of nighttime. The staff usually became aggressive, repeating the ominous phrase, The store is now closed. Please exit the building and attacking anyone they came into contact with. Thanks to their ingenuity, the survivors in the IKEA had constructed barriers around their settlements to keep the staff out, and that did the trick, repelling the faceless employees that come at night. But little did anyone inside SCP-3008 realize that simple barricades wouldn't stop an entirely new threat from entering the store to disrupt their peaceful way of life. For outside the infinite IKEA, Something wicked was stirring. Meanwhile, at a facility belonging to the SCP Foundation, a researcher by the name of Corbin Donnell had recently been assigned to SCP-035. Also known as the Possessive Mask, this white porcelain mask could shift between a comedy grin or a tragic frown. It also had the nasty trait of being an evil psychic artifact that could manipulate anyone around it into placing the mask over their face. At that point, SCP-035 would take full control of its wearer, making them into a host for the mask itself. So, would you like to take a guess as to what happened to Researcher Donnell? The voice in his head, that persuasive whisper, it wouldn't leave him alone. All day long, it was there, but whenever Corbin was near SCP-035, it got louder, and as the days he was studying the possessive mask went on, the whisper became a shout. The screams to put on the mask were taunting him, keeping him awake at night, tormenting him all through the waking day, until eventually he'd had enough. Given that SCP-035 produced a corrosive black substance that usually melted anything around it, the mask had to periodically be taken out of its containment case so that the container housing it could be replaced. And it was during one of these transfers that researcher Donnell calmly swept in, pushing away the guards taking it out of its melted case before they could place it in a new one. The aggression from the researcher caught the security personnel by surprise, as did what he did next. Not caring what the possessive mask would do to him, Corbin lifted the white porcelain to his face. He wasn't even aware that the containment breach alarms were sounding. All that noise sank into the background as the psychic voice in his head got louder than it ever had before. There wasn't even so much as a split-second awareness from Researcher Donnell of the searing pain as the dark sludge oozing from the mask made contact with his skin, melting his face as he wore SCP-035. By that point, it was already too late. The possessive mask had full control. Corbin's body wasn't his own anymore. Although it still moved, walking quickly out of the room and through the halls of the Foundation facility, the researcher beneath was already dead. There was only SCP-035, piloting its newest host to freedom. Of course, while containment breach was still an urgent matter, the Foundation knew that SCP-035's biggest weakness was itself. 
The black secretion that poured out of the possessive mask would melt anything it came into contact with, and would ultimately cause the body of its host to melt into nothing. Once that happened, it would be far easier to recontain SCP-035. Someone would merely have to pick it up and place it back in the containment case. However, SCP-035 knew this, too. The mask itself was cunning. It hadn't just picked Researcher Donnell at random to be its new vehicle. It wanted him specifically because of his previous posting. Before he had worked with SCP-035, Corbin had been stationed to observe any potential changes at the entrance of SCP-3008. As it stayed firmly on the researcher's face, using him to carry itself out of the Foundation site it had been trapped in, SCP-035 was scouring the remnants of Corbin's mind. It used its innate psychic abilities to plunder the depths of his brain, looking for information. The location of SCP-3008 was right there, stored away safely in Researcher Donnell's memories, as was the way to get there. And on top of that, the reason SCP-035 had taken such an interest in making it to the infinite IKEA. During the Foundation's many years of study and exploration of SCP-3008, they came to learn that not all of the survivors inside the infinite IKEA had originated from the same universe. The current theory was that the entrances to this endless furniture store existed simultaneously in multiple realities, meaning that the people now living alongside each other, inside SCP-3008, were actually from varying different worlds across the multiverse. Now, if you were incredibly cunning, incredibly clever, and incredibly sick of being held captive by the Foundation, then perhaps you could figure out a way to navigate your way through the infinite IKEA. You could enter through the front door in one universe, and then exit into another. And of course, that was what the Possessive Mask was planning to do. As it approached the main entrance of SCP-3008, the black sludge leaking out of the mask had almost destroyed what was left of researcher Corbin Donnell. It wiped more of the corrosive secretion onto the guards stationed at the infinite IKEA, melting through them as SCP-035 made its way inside. First things first, the mask knew it had to find itself a new body to pilot before Corbin's expired. And it didn't take long for the possessive mask to happen across an unwitting candidate between the aisles of flat pack tables. At around the same time this was happening, Winston, having long since gotten used to the rhythm of life inside SCP-3008, was on his way to the food court. He knew the route by heart now, and as he strolled closer, he was pondering over what he'd help himself to today from the menu. But it was while making his way there that he noticed something, or rather, he noticed not something, that he usually did. There were no staff anywhere around. Although they did not pay the survivors any mind during the day, when the lights of the IKEA were on, Winston knew that the staff members were always present. There were usually a couple milling about the aisles he had to pass in order to get from the settlement of cookware to the food hall, but today, there were none. And while this wouldn't usually be any cause for alarm, it kept playing on Winston's mind as he sat down to eat his plate of Swedish meatballs. He'd been inside SCP-3008 for such a long time that he'd become accustomed to the routine of living there, and the absence of the staff immediately stuck out as something that was out of its usual place. Finishing his food, Winston asked around, talking with his fellow residents of the infinite IKEA, asking if any of them had encountered any of the tall, faceless staff members on their way to get their meals. Each and every one of them that he asked, from varying different settlements, all answered the same, that they hadn't spotted any staff all day. As much as they were a minor threat to the human beings living inside the infinite IKEA, the absence of the store's only other residents kept playing on Winston's mind. Whatever was going on, the staff seemingly vanishing couldn't mean anything good, and so he decided to venture out into the aisles to figure out what exactly was going on. What he found was unlike anything anyone had ever seen in SCP-3008 before. It took Winston several long and uneventful hours to catch even a momentary glimpse of a staff member. He almost felt like someone trekking through a forest looking to get a sighting of Bigfoot or some other elusive urban legend. But as the third hour became the fourth, he spotted a hint of movement between the aisles. Following at a safe distance, listening out for the slightest sounds, Winston couldn't help but think he detected the noise of something heavy being dragged along the stone floor. Peeking out from between the aisles, he saw them. 
A huge group of staff members were all huddled in a display dining room, only there was something different about all of them. They still retained their recognizable tall and humanoid shapes, with long, disproportionate limbs, but there was something smeared over the staff, a dark, oily black substance that seemed to melt through the floor as it dripped off them. From his hiding place, Winston soon saw where that substance had originated from. The thing being dragged across the floor was another staff member, looking more normal than the rest. One of the others, covered in the corrosive sludge, was gripping it by the collar of its IKEA polo shirt and bringing it through the group. Meanwhile, the ordinary creature was thrashing and flailing its lengthy arms around, trying to get free. It was dragged up to a staff member in the middle of the group, which turned and shocked Winston at the strange sight of it. This staff member, evidently the leader, had a face. Or rather, it was wearing a mask. SCP-035 was now firmly affixed to the slender, faceless being, its expression locked in a wide grin that seemed to convey a twisted sense of glee. Its black secretion didn't seem to be affecting its new host in the same way it usually did. The body of the staff member it was now piloting didn't seem to dissolve. As the uncorrupted staff creature was presented to the masked leader, SCP-035 compelled its newfound followers to restrain their prisoner. The workers within SCP-3008 didn't have much in the way of their own free will, or even personalities to speak of. They did, however, seem to share some sort of connection to each other, a hive mind of sorts. So presented with a powerful psychic force like the Possessive Mask, the entity had been able to not only take over one of the staff members as its new host, but spread its influence to the others. And while Winston watched horrified, it unknowingly demonstrated this. The captive staff member was grabbed and held by the others, its long arms and legs pulled apart. The huddled group lifted it up off the floor so that it couldn't free itself and run off into the endless aisles of furniture. Wearing SCP-035, the leader extended an arm, black ooze dripping from it, the droplets burning holes in the floor as it reached towards the faceless head of the restrained staff member. It placed a large hand over the faceless head of the captive. More of the corrosive secretion passed on to the newest addition to SCP-035's growing army. As the black substance spread over the staff member, so did the influence of the possessive mask force its way into another vessel. I'm telling you, I know what I saw! Winston protested, after recounting the events to the other settlers back at Cookware. There's something else out there, something new and dangerous, and it's infecting the staff. Oh, that's ridiculous, replied Bryce, one of the survivors who had been there much longer. I've been here for years and I've never even heard of such a thing, they yelled. I saw it with my own eyes, Winston argued. It has a small army of them already under its control. Even if what you're saying is true, someone else chimed in. What does it matter? We've already got barriers that keep the staff out, and they only attack at night anyways. Surely, even if this mask thing really is in control of them now, who cares? As if on cue, one of the lookouts at the cookware settlement started frantically trying to get everyone's attention. They pointed to the ominous glow coming from just beyond the nearby aisles filled with wardrobe frames. An orange flicker was visible, even under the lights of the store which were still on, although blocked a little by thick plumes of black smoke rising up towards the ceiling. That's lighting, the lookout said in shocked disbelief, stating the name of another nearby community of survivors that was named after an IKEA store department. Something must have happened over there, Bryce declared. Uh, maybe it's an electrical fire that's gotten out of control. It's them, Winston said solemnly. It can't be them, the older survivor snapped. The lights are still on, it's still daytime in the store, and the staff never attacked during the day. I don't think the rules are the same anymore, frustrated Winston continued to argue. There's no telling what that mask did to them. Uh, perhaps. Bryce was trying desperately to come up with a suggestion, but was clearly grasping at straws. Uh, what if this mask can be reasoned with? If it's more intelligent than the staff, we can... We can negotiate. Uh, there must be something it wants. What do you think it wants? It wants this place, this Ikea! And now it has control of enough staff to form a small army. You think it's just gonna stop there? It's coming for all of us, and it won't stop until it's got the whole store under its control. And if it has to wipe us out to do that, well, it looks like it's not hesitating. So what do we do? A voice called meekly. Winston turned to see the townsfolk of Cookware had gathered, all looking up at him with terrified expressions on their faces. He gazed back at each one of them, then looked back over at the smoke now towering over where lighting had been. 
and was now in flames. Who knew how many of the settlers there were still alive, and how long it would be before SCP-035 and its new army did the same to Cookware? Something had to be done. We need to get the word out, Winston announced to the other survivors. I need our fastest to run over to the other towns in the store. You each take one, you pass on the message, and then you come back. You know your way around well enough, so avoid anywhere you'd normally see staff. Even if they haven't been corrupted, we can't chance it. Why don't we tell the other settlements? Somebody in the crowd called. You tell them what's going on. You say that something has come here to threaten this Ikea and our way of life. This place isn't where any of us first came from, but it's all our home now. It's provided for us, but now it needs us to defend it. Winston explained. And how exactly are we going to do that? Bryce asked. The lights had gone out, but although night had fallen, it wasn't dark yet. Standing with their fellow survivors from numerous other settlements, the residents of SCP-3008 had fashioned flaming torches from the legs of IKEA desks and tables. And that wasn't all. They were carrying makeshift weapons. Some had spears crafted using curtain rails with sharp kitchen implements fashioned to the end. Others had wardrobe doors in their hands to act as rudimentary shields. They were hardly warriors, but as an army of corrupted staff members lurched out of the darkness towards them, each survivor of SCP-3008 knew what they had to do. At the front of the army towered the staff member with SCP-035 on its faceless head. The possessive mask's wide grin had shifted, now a long frown, almost one of disgust at the amassed settlers who opposed it. As it raised an elongated arm to command its horde, Winston raised a curtain rail spear into the air. FOR IKEA! he yelled as the residents of SCP-3008 charged. Alarms go off all around the facility. Things descended into chaos so quickly. Of course, the staff of the SCP Foundation are extremely familiar with the horrors of a containment breach by now. But this was something exceptional. Two anomalies had joined forces in an unexpected fashion, neutralizing some of the weaknesses that the two of them usually experienced. Needless to say, this was bad. More specifically, 74 staff members were dead already. Several different mobile task forces had already been dispatched to hunt down this terrifying new anomaly, but none of them knew where it was hiding in the depths of the site. Little did they know, this deadly new hybrid had already escaped the SCP Foundation and was already on its way towards a nearby population center. That's where the real fun would start. But before we get to all that carnage, Let's rewind the clock a little and find out how this disaster started. Some things just go great together, like peanut butter and jelly, milk and cereal, or clicking subscribe when you're watching a video by SCP Explained. But for every match made in heaven, there's also a match made in hell. Like being covered in sugar water while you walk past a wasp nest, or doing tricks with your awesome Zippo lighter next to a gas pump, or most horrifying of them all, a combination of SCP-106 and SCP-035. Of course, the reputations of these two horrible creatures are well known and well feared enough on their own. SCP-106 is a humanoid abomination also known as the Old Man, capable of walking through walls and entering his own private pocket dimension, where he practices his predilection for pain to its full potential. And then there's SCP-035, also known as the Possessive Mask. This is one of the most powerful and dangerous psychic entities that the SCP Foundation has in its vast collection. Some of its more minor, unpleasant qualities are things like the fact that it constantly drips corrosive black slime, or the fact it immediately reduces you to a state of brain death when you're foolish enough to wear it. On the more severe end of its abilities is its power to crawl into the mind of anyone around it, slowly whispering horrors into their mind until they're completely under its control, or utterly broken. It likely has designs on world domination, or at the very least, to plunge the human race into an unimaginable pit of eternal suffering. The one saving grace is the fact that 035's corrosive slime slowly destroys the body of its hosts, limiting the purview of each one of its reigns of terror. But occasionally, there are wonderful, terrible exceptions to the rule. Speaking of terrible, our story began chronologically with SCP-106 showing one of its rare signs of activity. This, naturally, caused waves of panic to rock through the researchers and security staff of the site. They'd need to grab a D-class, then plug in and warm up the femur breaker. 
They'd also need to mobilize groups of on-site guards with powerful flashlights to slow the gnarled old monster down. But by now, SCP-106 had gotten wise to the Foundation's techniques. He wouldn't make himself so easy to capture this time. He wanted to have the proper time to enjoy himself. SCP-106 got up and phased through the nearby wall. His cell was never easy to escape. They filled it with strange shapes and running water, just to confuse his wretched old mind. But once he was out, he was out. He avoided the hallways, instead just phasing from wall to wall, until he reached a different block of containment chambers. That's where the fateful meeting would take place. It wouldn't be the first time he'd wandered into other containment cells, his battle with SCP-682 perhaps being the most famous, but this time, something was different. The room he'd just faced into didn't contain some huge writhing monster or another humanoid beast. It contained instead a glass container on top of a podium. The walls coated in deadly telekill alloy to keep its prisoners' immense psychic power sealed in. But now that SCP-106 was in the room, standing mere feet away from the grinning white mask inside the glass container, there was nothing keeping the two of them from having an extremely fateful conversation. The first thing SCP-106 noticed was the black liquid leaking from the mask. Strange, it seemed to perfectly match his own secretions. Hello there, good sir. It isn't often I have visitors in here, and even less so visitors who are as handsome as you. The mask said, speaking directly into the old man's frail, fractured mind. I don't believe we've ever been acquainted. Come a little closer and remove the glass box. I'll be able to hear you better that way. Come on, come on. Don't be shy. The old man felt something about the mask was distasteful. Even to a creature as despicable as SCP-106, something about the mask just seemed slimy, metaphorically as well as literally. And yet it found itself stepping forward towards the glass case, almost as though he was sleepwalking. How was the mask invading his mind like this? He'd always been one of the more mysterious creatures in the Foundation's containment, and yet SCP-035 had slipped into his mind like a warm bath. On some level, it frightened him. Yes, yes, that's wonderful. Come closer, dear boy, you're doing so well. The mask said as the old man reached forward and began lifting off the glass case. I think I'd look rather good on you, don't you agree? Let's cover up that nasty old face of yours. You'll look positively spiffing, old chap. Just do exactly as I say, and this is all going to go wonderfully. The old man picked up the mask, somehow not even in control of his own body anymore. An almost electrical power seemed to pulse out of the mask and through the old man's rotting fingertips. The old man was a sadist, but he'd never before encountered this kind of utterly malicious intelligence. This was a mind geared to commit almost incalculable evil, and while the old man was wondering how exactly he felt about that, he was already lifting the mask up to his face and watching the universe go very, very dark. Outside, a small army of Foundation security operatives, armed with flashlights and assault rifles, were charging through the halls, trying to trace the movements of the old man for recapture. Back in the old man's cell, a confused serial arsonist was being shoved into the femur breaker by a group of nervous and impatient researchers. None of them knew they were dealing with an entirely different beast down here now. Eventually, the security team found the last rusty scorch mark on the wall of a containment cell belonging to SCP-035. Before they could even comprehend the terrifying implications of this horrible scenario, they charged into the cell in hopes of stopping it. But by the time they were in there, both the old man and the mask were already gone. Well, not entirely. Suddenly, the guards in the room felt an odd sense of calm wash over them. Not a true, authentic calm, but an artificially induced one like the lulling of a cattle while a bolt gun descends towards their foreheads. The mask's psychic influence had pacified them, making them perfect prey for the rotten hands reaching out from the ground and pulling them down into oblivion. The guards outside heard the most horrific screaming. They circled the door, terrified, aiming everything they had at the entryway, but it wouldn't be enough. Soon enough, this new hybrid beast, 
SCP-106 wearing SCP-035 emerged and began its onslaught. It had the immense physical abilities of 106, bolstered by 035's diabolical intelligence and ability to cloud the minds of its victims, inhibiting their capacity to run away or fight back. But most frightening of all, because SCP-106 was already adapted to resist the effect of its own corrosive mucus, it was also perfectly able to sustain the mask as a host without ever melting and falling apart. See what we mean about a match made in hell? How do you like my new body, gentlemen? The mask asked, its voice dripping with malicious glee. It isn't much to look at, I know, but you're about to get very well acquainted with its collection of charming abilities. And the mask stayed true to its word. It rampaged through the containment site, waltzing through walls like a gleeful schoolchild with the heart and mind of the devil himself leaving a pile of melted, tortured corpses in its wake. Researchers, guards, janitorial staff, nobody was safe. And with every killing, the rest of the staff became increasingly afraid, only strengthening the psychic hold of the mask. It was having the best day it could remember in a long, long time. The site director and his team put out a mayday for all available mobile task force units to descend onto the area and help them deal with this deadly new threat. But by the time they were on their way, the mask and its new SCP-106 body had already had its fun with the Foundation. Even when they activated the femur breaker, nothing happened. The mask was far more interested in the pain it could cause outside, and far too intelligent to be lured back into imprisonment by such a simple trick. Instead, the hybrid made its way out of the nearby perimeter wall, finding its way to a heavily armored Foundation ground vehicle and sliding in through the door like a ghost. The operative in the driver's seat was immediately terrified by the monster suddenly sitting next to it, but then the mask's psychic effects took over his mind. He became a calm, placid little servant, just like all those other mortal fools. I feel like a change of scenery, old sport, the mask said to him. Take me out to the nearest city. It can be the one of your choosing. I feel like having a little night on the town. Oh, it's been far too long, you know." The hypnotized driver nodded and punched the gas. The guards were too busy controlling the aftermath of the chaos within the site to even notice the creature they were chasing had already escaped. And if it reached a nearby city, then the chaos, cruelty, and madness it was liable to release would be the biggest mess the Foundation would need to clean up in quite some time, which was precisely what the malicious mask had in mind. Meanwhile. Dr. Robert Scranton woke up in a dark room. Well, he wasn't sure if it was a room, but it was definitely dark. He rose to his feet in this strange black void, surrounded on all sides by blackness. It wasn't the belly of SCP-3001, the dreaded red reality again. No, this was something new. And what's more, he had no idea how on earth he'd gotten here. Dr. Scranton, said a cruel mocking voice behind him. Turn around, old chap. It's been far too long since I've seen you in the flesh. Well, in a manner of speaking, at least. Confused, Dr. Scranton turned and saw a vaguely familiar sight. SCP-035, the possessive mask, floating in the dark behind him. What on earth was happening here, he wondered. Oh, you really don't remember, do you? <laughs> the mask said with a spiteful laugh replying to a thought he'd never voiced aloud. You're in your mind, Doctor. As it turns out, you're harder to erase than I thought. Perhaps you're buried so deep in the psyche of that monster. <laughs> no matter, I'll get you eventually. How strange, Dr. Scranton thought. This must be his mind playing tricks on him somehow. He raised a hand to scratch his head quizzically, and only then realized that his right hand was gone, simply vanished from the end of his wrist. The mask gave another sick laugh. <laughs> oh, it's already started! I told you I'd get you, Scranton! <laughs> the mask cackled with glee. I never normally get to delete a mind slowly. Oh, this will be amusing. Where's Anna? Scranton asked, suddenly wondering about the safety of his beloved wife. He couldn't help but worry when this got another cruel laugh out of the mask. <laughs> Oh, don't you remember, Robert? The mask said through giggles. 
<laughs> you killed her. You killed her with your toxic embrace. She died terrified of you. And with that, all the awful memories came flooding back. Back in the real world, things weren't any less horrifying. When the vehicle had finally made its way to the nearby city, the masked old man had unceremoniously murdered its chauffeur and decided to go for a little exploration. It had been so long since it felt the sun on its pristine white porcelain. Such a beautiful day outside. It couldn't wait to kill some people around here. It began its rampage in a dark alley, snatching some homeless people and unfortunate passers-by through the graffiti-stained stone walls. By the time it was done with them, there weren't even any bones left. But this would only be the start of the masked old man's horrific rampage through the city. Next, he invaded an office building and decided to unleash his grisly wrath on the people within. Some were pulled through the ground while chatting at the water cooler. Others were dragged through the walls as they went to refresh their coffee. Some were simply sitting at their desks, getting on with their daily work, when a dark silhouette appeared behind them. Some turned around, saw the creature, and screamed immediately. Others remained in ignorance and only screamed when an acidic, rotting hand curled around their shoulder. But every single one of them screamed eventually. By this point, the SCP Foundation had started sending all the mobile task forces in the area to the nearby city after receiving reports of unexplainable disappearances and murders. Panic was starting to spread, and that panic was only making the nightmarish psychic abilities of the mask even stronger. The challenge would be intercepting SCP-106 and removing the mask before it became too powerful for them to do anything about it. If they didn't, they could be looking at a loss of life on a massive scale. Which was exactly what SCP-035 hoped to indulge in. A young barista was having a stressful day at a nearby boutique coffee shop. She retired to the staff bathroom to splash some water on her face and recenter herself. She sighed and looked up from the sink into the mirror to see if her makeup was running, and then screamed. A dark figure was standing right behind her. It looked like a rotting human corpse, dripping with black slime, and wearing a grinning white ancient Greek comedy mask. I'm not interrupting anything, am I? The masked old man said, amused. Soon after the dark presence had spilled out into the coffee shop, the psychic powers of the mask caused its victims to be paralyzed with sheer terror, unable to escape its cruel hands. The death toll of the day had already risen to over a hundred, and the masked old man had no intention of stopping. That's when several police cruisers skidded to a halt in front of the coffee shop. Cops disembarked from their cars and pulled out their handguns. Step out of the store with your hands up! One of them yelled over a megaphone. Any sudden moves and we'll blow you to kingdom come! This made the masked old man laugh. <laughs> oh, how very adorable. Not long after, he was driving a police cruiser further into town, with a pile of dead cops left in the street behind him. This was shaping up to be such a wonderful day, he never wanted it to end. Back in the pitch dark of the mindscape, Dr. Robert Scranton was looking a little worse for wear. Both of his legs had disappeared, along with one of his eyes and much of the rest of his right arm. His remaining eye was weeping, remembering how his embrace as the old man had killed his beloved Anna. He'd lost his humanity and become the worst kind of monster, the kind who even hurts the people he loves most. SCP-035, floating in the darkness, was still just laughing at him. <laughs> oh, you pathetic Scranton, it said. Look how little is left of you. You haven't even been human in decades. Why not give up what little is left? You're mine now, and soon you're going to be nothing at all. And Dr. Scranton kept crying because he feared the mask was right. Back in the city, the stolen police cruiser pulled up in front of a preschool, and the masked old man got out. This would be the perfect place for his next little slice of fun. Straightening himself out, he began walking to the school, knowing that with the extent of his psychic powers, nobody would be strong enough to run away. They'd all just have to sit there and suffer, just like Dr. Robert Scranton. Goodbye, old man, the mask said to him. I'm tired of talking to you now. Dr. Scranton was ready to give up and let himself disappear. But then, something occurred to him. Knowledge from his Foundation days, 
I, I, I must be wearing you, Dr. Scranton said. I must be wearing you. Scranton reached up to his face with his remaining hand grasping at something. Suddenly, the face of the floating mask twisted into an infuriated frown. What do you think you're doing? It said. It's too late, Robert. But Scranton wouldn't be deterred. He gripped something invisible over his face and began to tug, even though pulling on this invisible mask on his face was agonizing. The whole void around him began to shake and quiver, including the grimacing SCP-035. Scranton just kept pulling. Stop that, you idiot! It roared. Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! You're going to ruin everything, you! But it was already too late. Dr. Scranton murmured, I'm sorry, Anna, and gave one last yank. That's when everything went white. Back in the city, it thankfully wasn't long until a group of mobile task force agents was able to locate the two anomalies. SCP-106 was sitting cross-legged on the grass outside of a preschool, where thankfully nobody had been hurt and was just staring off into space. In his trembling hands was another familiar sight, a frowning SCP-035. Now go check out the whole story, what if SCP-096 wore SCP-035, and SCP-106 The Old Man Origin Theories, for more tales concerning today's terrifying anomalies.